chaos out there for the guys who are faster. Yeah, yeah, it's really difficult. Uh, Multi-class racing is, is thrilling at times, but it really makes it busier than it is. And at Atlanta, it's a very busy racetrack. Yeah, no question about it. On board, we'll have all the on board covered with Doug Peterson, Tommy Dreesey, hopefully Cameron Lawrence. We've got uh, some of the categories. Lee Saunders, I believe, is also uh, uh, has an on board. And of course, we have a drone in the sky. Now, what is the hardest corner in your mind, or Kerry? Well, or what's the key to the first lap? I, perhaps is a better question. Uh, well, turn one is always kind of difficult. Uh, if you got turn turn seven coming onto the straight, that's that's extremely important to get there again. Looks like you got some action in the pits. Yeah, it looks as though a problem for car number six in the SGD class. Uh, that's uh, Carrie Grant. And uh, big weekend for the Grants. Yeah, yeah. So they come down the hill. This is where the overtaking place is on the inside there where Martin Ragginger in the all gold card who won in TA yesterday. And we're on board also with Chris Dyson, a winner at Road America. We'll keep an eye on Skeeney. He's had five wins so far this season. He is a 57 point leader over Rafa Matos and therefore has won the title. But that won't stop Rafa coming at him at this start. Here we go, folks. The Trans Am finale from Road Atlanta gets underway and it's a great start from Chris Dyson. Ragginger goes to the inside in the 17, but he cuts the nose off. And again, the number 20 flat car who had power steering for... Oh, Tommy Dreesey gave us a fantastic view of that. What a moment there for Tommy. And he didn't really lift, did he? Wow, Kerry, that was a moment and a half, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I hate to see things like that happen. Uh, uh, probably cold tires. I mean, first yeah. lap, cold tires, it, it's, it's really difficult. That felt like it was all in slow motion, but uh, Tommy did the right thing. He just watched it and watched it. Yep. He didn't lift off and didn't lose anything. He yep. lost a little bit of time, but didn't lose any places. So it's Chris Dyson in the lead from Martin Ragginger. And then Tommy Dreesey in third place. Boris said fourth. Justin Marks fifth. Amy Rubin up there in sixth. Simon Gregg, good friend of yours, I'm sure, in seventh place. And Jeff Hinkle. Sadly, Kerry Hitt not in there, but he's twitching here at the Gobbin Tribune, <laughs> almost going through the motions because uh, he'd love to be out there. What have you seen so far, Kerry? Great start. Uh, sad for Boris. I hope, hope he uh, got back on track. I'm not sure if he uh, got on there or not, but those things happen. You know, like I said, everybody's anxious. you got cold tires and a cold track. So uh, uh, it'll probably... Uh, See if he gets back on again. Yeah, it was one of those crashes where it looked like he had a little bit of control to it. I.e., he was just sliding. Yeah, but he wasn't going to crash it, and he may just be able to get it back on uh, track. But it was, was Boris said we can't confirm who's gone off uh, at the top of the hill there, just on cold tires. And back in the booth now is uh, Ben Sissel. And uh, Ben, was there anything you learned besides what you told us? Oh yeah, quite a bit. But look at this coming into. Turn one, we've got uh, Cameron Lawrence going up the hill. We're in board with Cameron Lawrence in a really treacherous part of the track. But I'll, after the race calms down a little bit, I'll give you some inside stories. Okay. On board with Cameron Lawrence, who had a, a very eventful day. He came so close to winning the race yesterday. Made one mistake coming out of seven. That's all it took. And Kerry, you know what this track can do. It can bite you, can't it? Uh, oh, in a hurry. Absolutely. Uh, turn one was a good example. Uh, it's a very busy track. You're on the wheel all of the time. There's virtually no time to relax at all. Mike Skeen at the moment leading Cameron Lawrence in TA2. The leader in TA is Chris Dyson. We've been watching that one. That's Ray Evernham in the white number 26. Here's a little insight. Go ahead. Ray's famous for building and racing the Ghost, one of the fastest road racing cars out there. He had an off yesterday, and the team used white gaffers tape to tape it up, so now they're saying that he's racing the mummy. So he's racing the ghost and the mummy as we see Ragginger come up right behind Dyson. Well, already they're starting to catch up with some of the GT cars, and Ragginger looking for a way past uh, Dyson, and Dyson's got to be careful now. He's got to choose his moment well now. They're coming into five. He wants to get past him on the hill up here. He needs to get past the uh, GT card, he's done that. 
And now as they head down to six, he's managed to just uh, gap himself from Ragendon so he can't make a move. There's Greasy under pressure though from Marx. And Boris said was the man that went off, and so Dreesy's still there in third place, but he's getting some real attention. Now, let's see whether Marks can overtake him down that back straight. A really frenetic start to this, just what we hoped for. Ernie Francis Jr. currently sixth overall in the race, and sixth therefore in TA. And did we announce that Ernie has pretty much officially won the championship yes, by yeah. taking the green? So congratulations to the Breathless team as we ride along board with Cameron Lawrence and his three-dimensional services group Camaro. But Raginger is getting right behind Dyson. So this black car there we were looking at, Justin Marks, is now Ernie's in fifth. Uh, yeah, Ernie's got past Amy Ruman, yeah. yeah. Uh, Justin Marks actually said he had to go in for oxygen after yesterday's race because uh, he had some exhaust problems in his cabin. So after the race, he finished fourth like a trooper, but then he had to go get oxygen. And that same thing is happening to Lostovsky's left rear end. I hope that's just fuel cell venting. Well, it is. It is. We saw it yesterday. Like it's fuel. just extra fuel, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, we saw that yesterday. Issues. Yesterday he had clutch issues and said he expects to be at the top of the podium today. Now, just heard from race control that Dreesy's got some sort of problem. Now, what's happened to Dreesy? We just heard from race control that Dreesy... Something sounds bad. You hear that? Yeah, something doesn't sound right. A limiter carry? What do you think that is? I think he was probably in the limiter there. Was He was shifting. Uh, the, we have an 8,600 RPM rev limit, and then there's a soft touch. As you get up there, it just starts to miss a little bit. But, uh, well, if Justin Marks does get by, we'll know that there is a problem. But right now, he's holding him off as he comes under the bridge to complete another lap. Long way to go in this. It's a 100-mile sprint race. We're on board with Tommy Dreesey, 126 miles an hour down the front straight. But it's still a great battle between Dyson and Raginger. Martin Raginger of Austria joining the championship for the first time this year and already a winner. But is that smoke coming out of the back of Tommy Dreesey's car, or is that okay? That looked like smoke. Well, that wouldn't be where a fuel cell would be venting. No, it, it should be, yeah. Uh, Justin Marks is coming up right behind him. But, hey, this is shaping out to be really good in TA. Ernie Francis has nothing to lose. He's won the championship, and he's coming up strong. He wants to win this race. Uh, Boris said if he can get back out there, never count him out when he goes off so early. And here comes Ernie Francis, and he's not that far away from this battle we're watching in TA between Marks. Justin Marks is another newcomer, relatively. He's done some Trans Am before, but he came back, and he's also advertising the fact that TA2 will be going to Nashville, and I know that makes you happy. Yeah, the Music City Grand Prix, the guy right behind Dreesy is one of the owners right behind him of the Music City Grand Prix. So there's two owners of the Music City Grand Prix in the race today, Justin That's Marks wild. and Scott Borchetta. Really cool. Now, Marks, well, okay, Kerry, let me ask you this. Let me put you in Justin's 99. Where are you going to have a go at Tommy, and why? Well, was, breaking into turn one is is good. I mean, that's, that's a, strategically you try to get everybody set up for that. Uh, and then uh, the downhill, breaking into downhill. This is a kind of course where I you, you do better at overtaking when you're braking than you do under acceleration because right. there's really not a lot of room to just drive around somebody. Correct, yeah. Well, he's just not close enough, nor is Raginger on uh, Dyson as we watch that battle. Flames flying out at the Plaid Mustang. Beautiful shots here as they come down into five at the bottom of the hill, into the hollow. But at the moment, Mark's losing a little bit of ground on Dreesy, so if there was a problem, he's rectified it as we go back with Dyson. Now you can start to see how much traffic there is. He's got Brobind on the outside in the 24. Nicely uh, done by Dyson to get through as he dives into seven. Lee Saunders is ahead of him now. And uh, he'll just try to drift through as quickly as he can and as smoothly as he can. Great start to the race. Good clean start to the race. 35 laps, long laps to go. We'll watch out for the fuel loads to go down and, of course, the tyres to start to uh, get used and therefore start to uh, slip and slide underneath them. Oh, Tommy Treacy makes a nice move on Lee Saunders. That was really nice. We're on board with the Viper now. Lee Saunders has had such a successful year, and through goes Marks, and that's important. What they don't want to do is get held up, and now they're all dealing with traffic. 
Uh, and Kerry, I think this is the hardest thing for a racing driver because you really can't anticipate what somebody in a different category who's racing hell-bent for leather exactly. is going to do. Exactly. It's important to be able to know and trust the people you're out there driving with. And, yeah, uh, and the marshals giving them the signals that there's a faster car coming. Too. Exactly, exactly. So that's Lou Gelati right there. He was on the podium with us yesterday in SGT, the 2-8 car. But I just got word I haven't figured it out yet from race control to stop scoring Lou Gelati. I don't know what's happened, but hopefully they work that out as Greasy gets by. Now look at this back battle here going on. We're watching this, but look at this menace in the background. There's the 28 coming through, but Ernie Francis Jr. just did a 121.078. He's the fastest man out there, and he's catching this battle between Greasy and Mark. Yeah, but Boris said was came at, back on track at like 32nd position, and he's picked up 10 already in 20 seconds, so don't count him out just yet either. Wow, look at the speed difference, Dan, that main straight from Greasy in the TA car. Of course, they're unlimited. You've never seen Trans Am. These are the unlimited TA cars. So they're about 850 brake horsepower, would you say? Yes, exactly. In the downhill there, you really don't get the feel watching TV as, yeah. as you get as you go over top of the hill, the car gets a little light, and then you're under really hard braking. It, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a thrill. Now, look how close Ernie Francis Jr. has got to the back of Marks. Ernie did another good lap last time out at 122.4. Justin Marks at 122.9. The fastest man on track, Martin Ragginger, in a 120.9, and that's pretty impressive. You know, something that doesn't get said about Ernie Francis Jr. enough, he is a fantastic driver, always with the championship in mind. You helped him out with the championship by giving him your B car one year at Road America. I remember that. But he is one of the most precise chess players with passing traffic. He works the timing and where to pass and how not to pass traffic to try to put as big of a gap or make up as big of a gap as he can. He's a master at traffic. Lawrence has got past Skeen. Now Lawrence leads in TA2. <laughs> there you can see the all yellow and red of Cameron Lawrence ahead of uh, Skeen. Matos behind him. No, it's Merrill. Oh, sorry, Merrill behind Merrill, him. And then, and then Fratrell. Uh, then Matos. Yes. Look at that train right there. It's what I love about TA2 racing is it's such tight racing. What a battle! I spoke to Ray Evernham at the grid, and he says he loves this platform because it rewards good drivers and punishes poor drivers. Yeah. And I think that's right on. Well said. Best story of the weekend for me as we look at uh, Adrian Loskowski is the man ahead of him, uh, Franklin Prutrell who has, well, he was a Formula Renault champion back in 2008. He's done some bar, Skip Barber schools here at uh, Road Atlanta. But he's been, uh, it's, this is his debut in Trans Am, and he's killing it. Yeah, Franklin Fruchel has really impressed a lot of people here. Uh, obviously, yesterday with Ryan Eversley and uh, Andy Lolly, they were not surprised, but I'm sure some people are going to be surprised. Here comes Rafa. Looks in. Rafa. That's Merrill. Merrill, I keep saying Rafa. Merrill comes alongside uh, Mike Skeen. Now that Merrill doesn't have the arrow problems that he did yesterday yes. with the fender hanging off, he's, he's, he's quite quick. If you didn't see yesterday's race, Thomas Merrill, the man who we're keeping a close eye on right now, uh, had some body damage, which he finally rectified as the race went on. He just sort of fell off a little bit and didn't affect him. But this is a great battle for second place in TA2. Cameron Lawrence starting to stretch the lead. And yep. right now, Mike Skeen, the champion, is going to have to defend heavily from Thomas Merrill and Franklin Pratrell. But look what's happening. They've got Simon Gregg and Jeff Hinkle just ahead of them, and they're going to catch them at 7. And then the TA cars are going to pull away from the TA2 cars because they have more horsepower. And then they're going to catch back up to them in the twisty bits where it's really tough to pass. It's going to be really frustrating for this battle for the front TA2 to try to get around these huge, wide TA cars. You can see Adrian Lostowski in that beautiful Mustang come up over the hill. Ninth behind Lee Saunders in SGT. Nine points behind. High above the Road Atlanta circuit. A little bit uh, smoggy in the distance, but it's heating up nicely. We've had a beautiful November day and weekend here at Road Atlanta. It's been absolutely gorgeous. I was worried it was going to be a little chilly for our guys, but uh, it was kind of toasty out there, wasn't it, yesterday? So, everybody's sort of settling down, and I say that, but uh, it's not settling down at all. This is, um, we were talking about it yesterday. It, it's hard to describe, but it's like a, it is a sprint race. I mean, this, you're, not, you're not doing eight tenths, are you? Oh, yeah. No, it's a sprint race all out, and, and, it, uh, and on this track, it's a busy track, as I said many times. You're always on the wheel. Here's Justin Oaks, currently uh, 33rd and 1st in SGT. And, uh, yeah, no question that Justin Oaks has made an impact uh, this weekend. 
the SGT Championship just as hotly contested as all the others. And looking forward to see what Justin can do as he continues in 33rd place. And he's got uh, Mark Bromond up, who he's up against. And Mark was uh, just done his fastest lap at 128.7. He's in 35th, so he's not far away. They've got Bob Lima in between them. So a good battle starting to ensue between those guys. Wow. Scott Borchetti, you mentioned him. He's in 24th at the moment behind Doug Peterson. Ernie Francis past Justin Marks is now up into fourth place. Yeah, wouldn't it be interesting if Ernie Francis Jr. took the whole thing, took the whole pie? <laughs> He's out there to win it, that's yeah. for sure. Well, after the weekend they had, and just to catch you up if you didn't know, Ernie Francis Jr. came here uh, and looked odds on just to, to run away with the championship. I think he had something like a 43-point lead going into the weekend. And uh, it, it, it needed Dreesy to do something special. And then he got a break because Ernie broke a motor literally in the first lap of practice. And so they then had to redo the whole thing. And that would put him at the back for the first race. And then he had another problem. I think it was a clutch issue. And uh, that put him out of yesterday's race. But he still managed to pick up 15 points. And that was enough to put him over the edge. Look at that beautiful car right there, Justin Oaks, yesterday's SGT winner. He was with us at Circuit of the Americas in that same car, but under XGT specifications. And now here he is running that beautiful Drone Works Corvette with us in SGT. We hope to see him back in 2021 as Mark Brumman comes right up behind Lou Gelati. Go ahead, Kerry. Well, Lou Gelati is interesting. Uh, the, uh, the other Corvette was uh, Lou's son, Lewis, is the crew chief on that. So you got a little bit of a family uh, uh, competition going on there. I love it. I love and, this and, insight. And the big the big engine that he had uh, when he was at, at Coda, they pulled that out and they put a smaller engine in so they can run and lose class because they weren't in lose class at, uh, at Coda. So yeah. It's so that was the specification change to be able to go from XGT to SGT. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the leader, There's Scott Chris Borchetta. Dyson. Borchetta being passed there in the big machine vodka car. And we're on board with our leader, Chris Dyson, who's had some bad luck in the plaid Ford Mustang this season, but he wants to make it and finish on a high at the end of the season. There's Martin Ragiger. But you Ragiger. know, actually, I would say Martin Ragiger and Chris Dyson probably have the most experience racing in this multi-class. You know, Chris Dyson in so many, uh, I think he said 11 Petit Le Mans here. Yep, yep. And that's a huge speed differential. So he's used to this. So it's working out in his favor right now. But Ernie is also really good at this. Yeah. I tell you what, Chris Dyson's doing a hell of a job at the moment. His last lap at 121.3 was almost a second quicker than Ragiger. Now that's traffic, obviously, they're both dealing with. But at the moment, Dyson has managed to pull 2.3 seconds ahead of the Austrian. I would think that you probably would not see Ernie pushing quite as hard as he is because of the strategy. He now has the championship sewn up, yeah. so he doesn't have anything to lose. So yeah. he's going to go for it, I yeah. can tell you that. Well, there comes Greasy, passing some of the TA2 cars. There's Ernie Francis Jr., E2 in traffic. Yeah, you're right, Kerry. Really, the only thing he has to lose is he does work on his own car oh, yeah. with his dad, Ernie Francis Sr., so yeah. he... He'd like to go home back to Florida and go on vacation instead of have to fix his car. Yeah. But he wants to win this race. Oh, he does. I know that for sure. Kerry, when we see some onboard shots, and I'm listening to the engine, just tell us how you, especially in some of the places like the S's, you know, how much throttle you're doing and how much you use the brake as well when you see it for yourself. Because it's always an interesting insight. When, uh, when you go through it, you come down, uh, and, and the, the left-hander uh, is a second-gear turn. You have to stay kind of outside and set up for the S's. You're in third gear, and it's just a matter of, with the car, if the car's handling right, you can go down through the S's with the throttle to the floor. And a uh, lot of G-force, a uh, lot of speed, and then there's extremely hard braking, back into second gear, and turn five is a left-hander. Wow, look at that speed differential between the TA and the TA2 car as Francis goes through, and look at this. But look at the traffic, guys. This is like a Petit Le Mans race. And look at that. There's Boris said in the background. I just got a text from Poncho Weaver that said he ordered Boris said to go balls to the wall and win this race. <laughs> I so think Boris knows what that means. 13th place. He's picked up what? 17 places. Wow, this, go on, this Boris. Little bit of a race. So Put on a show. Expect uh, the monster of Boris said to try to reach the podium. He said there would be some hand grenades, and he's holding them. On board with Cameron Lawrence. 
drifting through that gearbox. Beautiful sound of muscle car racing here. I understand Boris's son ran his first race yesterday. He did. Yes, he's doing he did. really yes. well in our um, uh, SVRA's Heritage Miata class, and uh, we expect him now to be a Trans Am driver too. Two As more places from Boris. This is impressive. Very impressive. So Look at that. Skeen lap. ahead of Lawrence. Yeah, Skeen's got past him again. That was a really, really interesting maneuver too, because it wasn't a place you'd expect to overtake. Well, I think honestly, Lawrence was caught with uh, getting behind Boris said and letting him pass, and Mike right. Skeen just used that lap traffic. Because again, Mike Skeen is used to this multi-class racing too. Not that Lawrence isn't, but he might have a little bit more experience with it. And Merrill now also looking for a way past as well. Here's Boris said, currently ninth. What a major yep. incident that is. Because and if you remember, at the start of the race, he spun right out on cold tires. And we've got Mike Skeen coming up to Simon Gregg. So th that was the championship team there, Stevens Miller Racing. As we're on board with Cameron Lawrence, Mark Brumman to his left. Mike Skeen just ahead. So Lawrence knows there is traffic ahead of both of them, and this is another good opportunity to make a move on Mike Skeen as they head under the Motel Bridge at turn eight. And now the jink that is nine coming up. And then the braking at 10 is his best opportunity past one car. Oh, no! Oh, that's Edward Savagian. Savagian in the big machine Bonka uh, car. I don't know if he went off through 10A yeah, or if he, he took the little drift oh, he's thing. he's way, way. He's way yeah. off. But he's he high well center. through the gravel trap. Yeah, I think he went through the gravel trap because he wouldn't have tried to high center yeah. there. But he's in a safe area. We shouldn't have to go double yellow as I'm black getting flag. a black flag wave from Cameron Lawrence, it looked like. Well, maybe somebody's thrown down some oil because, look, uh, yeah, Rafa Macos has gone down But I just well. saw them waving a black flag at what I thought was Cameron Lawrence, maybe Thomas Merrill. I can't tell. Well, but our starter's waving a black flag angrily at somebody at the lead of the TA2 pack. All right. Well, back with the fight between Lawrence and Skeen. I'd like to hear from race control of who they're throwing a black flag at. What a intense race this is. Portrell still right there with Merrill. Skeen doing a really good job. He's settled down and he's got Cameron Lawrence all over him. And I think that's going to be the, the way for the rest of the afternoon for him. Mark Brumman in the 24 BMW. He's had a good season as Mark. Boris said now up to eighth place. Got Jeff Hinkle in front of him. Back with Lawrence again. There's the gap between himself and Ski. He's gaining on him. Yeah, he's uh, I don't certainly know if that's there. The if he just got a better push out of seven. What Lawrence has got to be careful of is that Merrill is is watching him okay. while he's watching Watch Ski. Watch the starter, Kerry, and tell me who you think. Oh, he's got a number out now. If we can get a shot of the starter stand, we might be able to see who he's black flagging. Oh, it's. It's this car. Oh, Lou. Lou, Lou Gelati. Lou Gelati yeah, is so, getting a uh, black stop flag timing him. They, they did say to stop timing him, so obviously he's ignoring black flags. That's a big no-no in any form of racing. So if you're listening to this and you're on the crew for Gelati, please tell him to come in. He's been black flagged. Wow, I've never seen so much traffic. What a melee. It's great stuff. Here comes Ernie Francis Jr. And look at the gap between himself and Dreesy. Dreesy's under pressure now from... Ernie Francis Jr., our champion, for the seventh time in TA. And Dreesy will not want the ignominy of being passed by his closest opponent. Which may Kearney want all the more to pass him. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a rotten weekend for the Breathless team, and they need something to shout about. And Ernie's determined to end his season. And you know, Kerry, after so many years of racing, it's a different winter when you finish on a high oh, than when absolutely. you can go out but on a low. Absolutely. Yeah. I try not to think about that considering I'm not out there this year. <laughs> yeah, yes, okay. But we yeah. are speaking to Kerry Head, Trans Am legend, who won our Masters group yesterday overall in TA. Yeah. He's here giving us some great commentary on this mixed group. And to, Kerry, how long have you been racing Trans Am? I uh, started racing Trans Am back in the uh, uh, late 70s. And so we ran up through the 80s. Uh, excuse me, no, I'm wrong. It was 80. It was the early 80s that started. Uh, yeah, I got my notes said you were in a Corvette in the late 70s. Yeah. And then rent, you moved off the track. Rent, rent a Corvette for quite a number of years. 
Look at this. Heck, if you can remember that well, that far back, you're ahead of me. <laughs> so what's Ernie going to do here coming down to 12? Dyson just got, or Greasy just got held up a little bit by lap traffic. So it looks like Ernie, look for him this lap to look into Dreesy as he defends the inside on Ernie. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's going to defend the inside because Ernie really needs to be down there right there going into one. So we've got great battles throughout this uh, racetrack and Ernie Francis Jr. is the next one about to pounce on Tommy Dreesy in the Lucas Oil car. So how much is Dreesy looking in the mirror or how much is he looking ahead, do you think? Uh, knowing Greasy, he's looking in the mirror. Uh, sometimes, uh, Greasy is a great driver, but sometimes he, he sort of psychs himself. Ernie is excellent at psyching him. He, he does that. I've seen him do that to, to Greasy. I've seen him do it to Chris Dyson. He just gets in their mind. Yeah. Yeah, Ernie is a chess player oh, more yeah. than a driver Absolutely. sometimes. Really impressive. And so let's hear if we can hear what Terry St. Martin might be saying to Greasy. He looks, watch his right arm. He's really... He seems very anxious. Yeah. Oh, oh well, he's going to be able to use a pick here, possibly. If he can get past those cars. Oh, ah, Dreesy really wanted to get past that THC car. There's Ray Everham. And now Ray oh, Everham. Oh, go on, Ernie. Oh. oh, Ray gets turned around somehow. Ernie misses him. Oh, big nice moment job. in this race. Nice. And I'll tell Great you what's move. funny. Ray is a huge supporter of Ernie Francis Jr. So Ernie wasn't about to hit him in the back. Ray, great <laughs> save. And there's Scott Borchetta, and it's Ray's fault that he got Scott Borchetta so into road racing. So thank you, Ray Everham. Great save. And then also bringing Scott Borchetta into the series. Just heard that Keith Projects uh, retired from the race with transmission issues. Wow, good, oh, Ernie. Side Ernie side. on the nice. grass. Almost. And somehow Dreesy recovers. But that was a, a very bold maneuver. I can see why he thought about it, but it wasn't going to happen, I don't think. That was one of those places I say there's no room for two cars, but they put two cars there. Right. He's going up now. He's got good drive here. He slots in behind Greasy, but he's on the outside. Greasy's got the better line into six. Now he should save himself for seven, tuck himself up behind Greasy. Kerry, you tell me. I don't know. I think there's going to be a good breaking moment at the end of the straight. If uh, Ernie can stay on his tail, he's going to get down into ten hard. Here we go, then. On board with Tommy Dreesy. He's all eyes in the mirrors, trying to pass as many cars as he can Lou before Gelati. he gets down to He 10. wants to put this blue car between he and Ernie. Yeah. But he hasn't got yeah. time to get past him. Ernie's got past Galati. No, not that time. Not that time. What a great game of chess between these two. At 160 miles an hour. I love it. Yep. They come up on Misha Goikberg, one of our best drivers in TA2. Lots of experience at Michelin Raceway Road, Atlanta. They're going to try to get by him before one. Well, Ernie wants to get past two, and he's, oh, he's going to get nope. stuck. Oh, oh, that's what that's what yep. Dreesy needed. Yep. Now this is going to be the hardest probably quarter mile for Ernie to get. Wait, so now Dreesy needs to step on it, try yeah, to put a gap Dreesy between them. Dreesy knows this is his chance to keep Ernie at bay. Ernie trying desperately to get, to get past now, but he can't, and now he does. He does. Nice move nice, by Ernie Francis Nice Jr. job. Really good. That's we not also easy. need to give credit to Misha, seeing him and knowing he's faster and letting him go. He did the right thing there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he hey. didn't want to get anybody exactly. in the way of the race. Hey, guys, we still got 21 laps yet left yet. <laughs> I got to breathe. This is great. Really good racing in all classes. Our big finale for the year. It's been a heck of a season. Congrats to John Clagger as oh, Misha, Misha goes Misha. off. Yeah. Oh, no. Misha Goldberg goes off. Looks like something in the rear axle. Yeah, the tire like should be the tires like not that. should be sticking like that. Something yeah. could have broken there. Now the next question that's is, gonna that's going to be a double six. yellow. That's going to be. He's at turn six. Yeah. Surely that's a double yellow. He's yeah. at a bad spot. You can yeah. see the corner that's where he's dangerous. talking. Lou Gelati just got waved another black flag. Now that could slow things right down. You can see the smoke there, your top left at turn six. And um, I haven't gotten word yet from control, but they're still flat out. We're waiting for the flags if there are any. Well, we're also hoping that maybe he can restart it and get going again. So, oh, just Lawrence. got word. Double yellow, everyone. Yeah, double yellow, yeah. yeah. Now, Dyson, now at the time, had what, just a second of a lead over Raginger. That wasn't significant. Ernie Francis, though, uh, and Greasy will get a chance to restart. Might help Justin Marks to get back in the fray. And Boris said it's seven. Yeah, this is working out perfectly for Boris. 
It's uh, really unfortunate for BC Race Cars, Misha Goitberg. He's always really good here because of the pandemic. Blaze and his team haven't been able to race that much. They're supporting two cars, Michelle Abadi and Misha Goitberg. So thank you for that, Blaze. But uh, really unfortunate because Misha's always in the hunt for a top spot. Blaze builds really good cars. Uh, yeah. Great, great team. Uh, he, he, his wife run the business and uh, always come up with good cars. They're always competitive. Just saw Connor Mosack pulling off in the number 96 at T82, the man from North Carolina. And he's just gone back to uh, the pits. So, Kerry, now that the safety cars come out, let me explain that if this is your first time watching road racing. Everybody kind of has to pack up as they are in order behind the pace car. And now you're talking to your chief mechanic, probably Roger Linton. And what, uh, what are you telling him right now? Uh, it depends on where we are and what's happening and, and going on. If everything's working right with the car, uh, we stay kind of quiet in the radio, you know, and he, he, he's good at that. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to... Uh, is for Roger, anyway. is that who you're talking to? Roger, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, I, I, I'd rather concentrate what I'm doing driving-wise. That's me personally, you know, other people like to talk a lot. Uh, but I, I just usually only complain if there's something to complain about, you know, so... So now hopefully race control will use this opportunity to uh, alert Lou Gelati of what is wrong. Maybe Lou could take this opportunity to come into Black Flag, fix whatever's wrong, and go back out. We're not quite sure what it is, but um, they're bringing the safety car. We just saw the flatbed go out. And uh, Jonathan, let's take this time and let's let's go through our yeah, list. Let's do it. So Chris Dyson first, Martin second, Ragginger in that Jen Amade car. Tommy Dreesey, so right now Burton Racing from Atlanta are two and three. Ernie Francis Jr. has somehow worked his way to fourth. Justin Marks fifth. Amy Ruman sixth, followed by Boris seventh. Boris said seventh. Simon Gregg eighth. And then we go to TA2. It's Mike Skeen, Thomas Merrill, Cameron Lawrence, Franklin Futrell, Rafa Matos. It's like a who's who of TA. Nolan, possible rookie of the year. Richard Grant in TA is in 15th. J uh, JP Southern is in 16th in TA2, 16th overall. Keith Prochuk, TA2. Barry Bogues, 18th. Doug Peterson, 19th. Tom Sheehan, 20th. Michelle Abadi from the West Coast in her first national championship debut at BC Race Cars is 21st. Nice job, Michelle. Chris Durbin in a new car. He had an off yesterday in the Challenger, and now he's in Debbie Cloud's Camaro. I hope you're watching Debbie. Chris Durbin's doing a good job. Jim Gallagher, our West Coast champion in TA2, is in 23rd. Maurice Hall, 24th. Aaron Pierce, 25th. Connor Mosak had a great day yesterday. He must be having some mechanical issues because he's usually a lot quicker than 26th. Well, Justin he's, he's Oaks. The one he just pulled out. Yeah. Okay. Justin Oaks is in SGT, is in 27th. I think he's first in SGT, but 27th. Probably out. I think that was a rear axle problem. And then Milton Grant, Billy Griffin, John Bauckham are all in GT. Ray Evernham is in 37th. Jeff Hinkle in TA is 40th. Edward Savagian out with only 12 laps and 41st. Stop scoring. And then Aaron Pierce. So that rounds out 42 cars. Too bad we got all this traffic ahead of us. But they earned it. They earned it to put it between me. So. I love it. Tommy literally giving you his own commentary. So sometimes in well, hold on. All right, so you heard so, it from Tommy. Sometimes in Trans Am, we uh, change up the order and put them in order as they were running. But in a five-class race, they're not supposed to. I'm getting word, but Tom, we just saw Tommy pass. So there's no wait by procedures. I'm hearing from race control, but Tommy did. Oh, he just came up next, so he didn't pass. But that that uh, happened to us a couple races ago, and and uh, it could have gotten squirrely, but they fixed it before the end of the race. 
but so that's what's happening right now. Tommy's upset because usually in, in races past, they do put you back in order, and that would put him right behind Martin, but now he's got some slower traffic just ahead of him in a different class. I just want to pause to uh, welcome all our viewers around the world on the app uh, and on Facebook and on YouTube. We welcome you fans of muscle car racing. This is the, the muscle car racing in its finest. All five classes, our grand finale. If you like what you're seeing, tune in, tune in next year because we've got a bumper field, some great races, including a street race at uh, Nashville. We'll be going to all the iconic tracks, including Road Atlanta here, Cota, Watkins Glen, you name it, we'll be there. And uh, it really is. Trans Am, you know, it may be the oldest road racing series. Kerry, you've been a part of it for a long time, but have you seen it as, as healthy as this? Uh, no, it, it's really tremendous. And the thing that's really great about these cars, once you drive one of these Trans Am cars, you really don't want to drive anything else. The, yeah. the TA cars are phenomenal. We've got, uh, now we're pushing 875 to 900 horsepower in a 2,800-pound 20, chassis. It's just absolutely thrilling. You know what? I hope we can go back into Lee Saunders' car. We got great insight into Lee Saunders. He has a front and rear camera, but Lee Saunders currently leading in SGT. And well, right behind him the riff. is Adrian I, I, say, I can tell you what's in yeah, his riff. We can see that. So I hope we go to that because that that's the closest championship battle we have left. There and, is uh, so there it is. So that's and there is Lostowski the back camera yeah. right behind us. So watch the restart for these two because Lostowski has got a chance to get ahead of Lee Saunders. There were five points between each other coming in to this round. Somebody else coming into the pits. I think he said nine. Jeff Nolan, I think. I think he said there are nine points based nine on points everything. Down, yeah. And uh, Adrian really wants to win this race. They're really close friends off the track, Kerry, but they're brutal, bitter competitors on track. And that's kind of the Trans Am family, isn't it? Exactly how it works. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, Jonathan, uh, years ago somebody once pointed out to me that in the paddock we're family. Out there we do battle. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, and I talked about Kerry here. Uh, I think it was last year in 2019. Ernie was in the chase for the championship, and he had an unfortunate off at the kink at Road America, and Kerry was nice enough to give him the B car, your rental car, which, yep. by the way, if you want to race in TA, call Kerry Hitt. He's got a great car for you. But you you did that to your competitor so that you can get the points. Why in the world? That sounds so counterintuitive. Well, it's, it's no fun to beat anybody if they're sitting in the pits, you know, and, and when you run, you're competitive and you want to be out there, and the whole idea is to be out there and racing and doing it. And it's in our blood. It's in our DNA, I believe, because you, you, just, you just will do whatever you need to do to make it happen. Well, guys, as they come down the hill, we will be green next time. We're watching out for Lee Saunders and Lost Toski. Obviously, everybody on the restart, we're looking for position. Dyson's got to defend from Raginger, who is so fast. Dreesy's got to defend as well from Francis. And then Justin Marks, obviously still in the hunt in fifth place. And watch out for Boris said he will want a flyer as well. And Boris didn't seem to do any damage to the car, despite that, that spin. Yeah, Boris is good at keeping the car out of the wall. He likes to make things exciting, but he doesn't like to damage the car. I did get word that it's a uh, green light. Yep. Green uh, Lights are off. Green flag this time by. Sorry about All that. All right. Yep. Here we go then. Watch out for Chris Dyson. He leads this massive field of over 40-plus cars getting ready for the start. Off comes. What's the strategy here, Kerry, for a restart? Well, well the, the tires are, are hot, but they're cooled down a little bit. They're not too hot. So the whole idea go. is to go as quickly as you can and as fast as you can. Good restart from Chris Dyson. Very good start. Great start. Yeah. Mike Skeen also gets away well. Popping out is Cameron Lawrence. Here comes Greasy. Francis with him. Everybody jostling for position. Lou's still out there. Yep. Lou Gigliotti is not going home, is he? he you don't to. know Lou. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't know Lou. I was on the podium with him yesterday, and he refused to wear a mask. Okay. So that's Lou. Okay. In a nutshell, I guess. Yeah. So then, the restart underway. Good restart from Petrell. He's all over the back. Greasy and Francis battling it out. Dyson's pulled a couple of lengths away from Raginger in the restart. Skeen's done the same on Lawrence. Uh-oh. Here comes Greasy. Greasy and Ernie up to the lead pack in TA2. This could get Dyson going into 10A. Yeah, look at this traffic. It's fantastic. There's Lee Saunders, and Lostowski's got ahead of him. Lostowski at the restart. Lost Saunders has lost... Several places. Put two cars between them. Yeah. Oh, and Boris has rear end damage. Yeah, that may have been from that uh, 
see it. That, it would have been that corner as he backed into it. He could have hit the wall a little bit. Well, we're on board with Saunders, but the car sounds okay. Yeah. And now look at him coming down to 10 because Francis is through. We go back on board with Dreesey. Arnie and Francis. Right right yeah, he has got past Dreesey. Yeah. So, all change. Francis is through and he's now behind Skeen. And uh, Tommy Dreesey's got work to do if he's going to stay with Francis because now Francis is going to get amongst the TA2 cars. Ooh, Thomas wide. Merrill almost, uh, Thomas Merrill's dropping back. He almost came off at 12, and now he's real slow as we're looking at Dyson coming up the hill and to turn five at the beautiful Michelin Raceway Road Atlanta, followed closely by that Jen Amade Camaro of Martin. That is a cool-looking car. Well, look at Raginga and Dyson pulling away from the chasing group. Oh. Skeen in it. Now look at There's Francis. There's our two champions. The power the the TA, TA champion yep. on the right, TA2 champion on the left there, and the white car of Mike Skeen letting them pass because it's a faster car. Dreesey goes through on Lawrence at six. Justin Marks right behind Dreesey. Back on board with Lawrence. Whoa, Marks just, just slips through at seven. Nice move, hey, Gary? That is a good move, and Justin Marks is going to be owning the NASCAR team, running the 99 next year. Daniel yeah, he's, Suarez. Uh, looking after Daniel Suarez, yeah. In NASCAR. Pretty exciting. There's Ernie Francis Jr. And now comes Dreesey. He's back on uh, terms now, or at least he's right behind Ernie, but he's lost about three car lengths uh, since the restart. Fascinating to see TA race against TA2, isn't it? Martin Raggy, though, he's a half a second faster that lap than Chris Dyson. Yeah, I thought he put a good lap, and he settled down. And Frutrell still with Cameron Lawrence. Yeah. There he is in the green and purple, the Augusta, Georgia man. The Joker car. And there's Boris. Boris still going strong. If he has damage, it's not affecting him too heavily. He's done a good do that traffic. He's in seventh place right now overall. Yeah, as you say, a 120.0 compared to a 121.0. So, uh, yeah, Raggy is definitely on the ragged edge. Here's Amy Ruman, most successful track for her career right here. She won her first race in Trans Am at 2011 here at Road Atlanta. And there's Boris. He's got traffic, but he'll get past it. So you've raced against two generations of Ruman. I have. I have. Uh, uh, Bob Ruman, good friend. I've known him for a long time. I remember when they used to show up in a... Uh, yeah, he was running a Camaro, and they had a tag-along trailer they pulled behind. I think it was a Suburban. And uh, they, they've been a tremendous support to the Trans Am series oh, yeah. and the family. We love having the Rubens, the McNichols, Chevrolet Corvette. Beautiful car. But let's be honest, who would you rather have in your rearview mirror, Amy or Bob? Bob. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> I think so, too. Just, just by their personalities, you can tell Amy's a little bit more aggressive. Well, back on board with Lee Saunders now as he comes out of seven. And he definitely lost some places to Lostowski uh, in, in the restart. And I'm just seeing if he can recover from this. But uh, he's got a lot of work to do in the closing laps, for sure. He's about, uh, well, he's two places behind Lostowski. Yeah. And this is where Lostowski has a disadvantage. That big V10, a Lee Saunders Viper, that's a long straightaway. So Lostowski really has to work to get a great exit out of seven so that that gap doesn't close up between them. Oh, spin right in front of us. Oh. We're, you're not seeing it on camera, but we had a bad spin Go contact. On the front Looks yeah. like Michelle Abadi. Oh. And that is uh, Three cars, that's Durbin. Three cars. That's Durbin in Debbie Cloud's car. That's the 16 of Jim Gallagher. And I believe that's a, uh, Michelle Abadi just ahead of him. So if that is Michelle Abadi in the blue car, Gallagher on the right in the red car, our West Coast TA2 champion, and a second place TA2 champion of Michelle Abadi right there is that's Durbin in the number 90. He wrecked uh, yesterday, unfortunately, in the Challenger, and uh, that was the B car for Stevens Miller. That's normally Debbie Cloud's car, so she let him use that as the leaders come through a little bit of a debris field here right on the front straight. I can't tell if that's Michelle or blueprint. Michelle. Well, I, that's Michelle. Yeah, and and Michelle is the number she's 20. Not, yeah, she's oh, not going man. anywhere. I yeah. know she's got it going. There Good she girl. is. She was just waiting for Travis to get out of the way. That keeps so, the race going. Ladies and sure. gentlemen, um, you know, we have our end of the year banquet 
And right now, I would say, based on the votes, that Michelle is leading the fan favorite <laughs> vote in Trans Am. So I'm sure there's a lot of Michelle Abadi fans that are heartbroken over that. But she's back out. She's back at that. And she is a fighter. And by the way, this is her national debut this weekend. She races on her own in the West Coast with her own family or kind of small team. But now she's joining BC Racing from uh, Canada. And I think this is a big step up for her. So she's really excited. Oh, there's Jim Gallagher. Gallagher had a problem yesterday, too. So all sorts of drama. Well, going he went on. off there's today. So he, uh, yeah, he, yeah, he went off and probably had a mechanical and tried to pull it, to his credit, in a safe-ish area. But that's unfortunate that's for Jim Gallagher. Area. Great yeah. racer. Yeah. As Boris, Boris says, says just weaving his way through. Go on, Boris. And knowing Boris, he knows the double yellow is probably going to come up. Yep. Yeah. Actually, I just got a safety stand down order from okay. race control. I'm listening to their radio right now, John. Oh, okay. So Cameron Lawrence gets passed by Ooh. Boris Seb with damage to the rear left, but Boris just flies off into the distance in the TA car, the Dodge Challenger, and with that's massive grunt. If but you're wondering Boris what that gone. damage is, that's just cosmetic damage. That's not really yeah. doing anything yeah. to the aero no. package. No. That's just a piece of fiberglass yep. that uh, Poncho Weaver really doesn't care too much about. He would rather come in unscathed, but he wants Boris to win. This is the battle for first place. Chris Dyson wanting to turn his year around quite literally. He was out of contention for the championship despite a win at Road America. He's not really been a factor, though he's always at the sharp end, either in qualifying or in the race. He's just not had the luck. And this has been an almighty battle for almost an hour now between these two. Here comes Ernie Francis Jr. as well. Back marker between them. And it's a big gap between Ernie and Dyson. Yep. Or Dreesy. I keep saying that, I'm sorry. Yep, Dreesy there. But, well, you say it's a big gap, it's not too big. It only needs one back marker to get in Ernie's way. And uh, through perhaps the S's. Where's the one place you don't want? Would it be the S's that you don't want a back marker? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the S's get awfully busy. I'm really surprised that they, uh, they're leaving that car there, but, you know. I am too, and I just got word through the radio that they are alerting all the teams that there's a car off on the left of four, driver's left. And well, uh, it, he's so not probably, on the racing line. I will, yeah, oh. I will say of any Wait, spot no, in the S's. Look how that, slow they're going. So they must be of a Yeah, they've slowed it right yellow. down. The double yellow is out. Yeah, okay. that, yeah, yeah. That, that was a smart And move. you can see debris right there to Chris Dyson's left. That's Billy Griffin, our GT winner yesterday yeah. in that green and Mustang. And our GT champion if he finishes yeah. the race. And now this, this oh, look what Dice, uh, Dreesy's doing right up next to Ernie. I think Dreesy is unhappy with Ernie about something. You think? Let's yep. listen in. Go man. Yeah, see that? Oh, it must have been a little combat. Apologies for the language, but uh, he is in the thick of it. And that is racing, folks. Chris Durbin in. And obviously, Tommy not happy. He's talking to his engineers, not us, I can assure you. <laughs> but uh, I think he's ha unhappy with Ernie, right? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like he's unhappy with Ernie. That's Chris Durbin there. This is his Trans Am debut, so welcome, Chris Durbin. I wish it was under better conditions. But uh, he's been fast. As they line up now, that's Ray Evernham right there behind Billy Griffin. Let's say this again. That is NASCAR Hall of Famer, Ray Evernham. And if we could get a close shot, you'd see why they call that the mummy. It's got a lot of white tape on it. <laughs> Amy Ruman, followed by Boris Said, Cameron Lawrence, Franklin Futrell, and that's Jet Nolan in the running for our Rookie of the Year at TA2. Safety cars are on course. Now, he's got his hand out the window. He was doing this yesterday, and we worked out Cameron Lawrence's uh, head cooler or helmet cooler carry wasn't working, so he's trying to get air into the helmet. Yeah. People don't realize how hot it gets in these cars. Right. I mean, you, you can get 140, 150 degrees in there. Hey, Ben, while you were down on the grid, I want you to make sure you know this story. Kerry is bringing the C8 silhouette next year. Yeah. Mid-engine? No. <laughs> yeah. We figured out how we can put that body on the front engine car. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Amy was happy to hear that. Yeah. So yeah. if you're wondering, Kerry, his company, Advanced Composites, Products. builds the bodies. He's a huge supporter of Trans Am, not just a driver, builds the bodies. And we were speaking at, at uh, 
PRI, the big racing trade show, and you showed me a picture, and it looks beautiful. It looks like a C8 Corvette. Oh, it, yeah, it does. It does. How are you going to be able to get that slanted front of the car? You can't call it a hood over that huge engine in a TA car. Well, we did the initial. We designed everything on computer, and we did the initial design, and the engine that we front engine that we put in there, we on the, and we don't have to touch anything. So in terms of a scoop, now to put a carburetor on, we might have to put a little bit of a bump in the scoop, but these all have bumps in, in the car. So wow. uh, we were able to take the Trans Am chassis and ghost it, and then lay the body over top of it. And then through a series, uh, we have, uh, uh, are able to manipulate the body and move it. So we moved the wheel wells down to the 102 inch wheelbase. And when we did that, the roll bar, of the Trans Am chassis stuck through just a little bit of the roof. So we took the roof and we manipulated it, moved it up and moved it back over. So now it fits over the envelope and that's the way we were able to but come so up with it. But so look at Dyson's front of his car. Yeah. Or even that Camaro or yeah. especially the Challenger. Yeah. I feel like the C8 body would have quite an aero advantage. You know, aero's funny. Uh, you, you would think that the, C, that the C7 Corvette was good aero-wise. You look at that car, and it's really not. Really, really not at all. The, the C6 that we had built was really good aero-wise. The C7 was really dragging. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about this. You were just with us two weeks ago at Circuit of the Americas. About 50 yards of the finish line. And I, I don't know if you've seen the broadcast, but I was screaming. I'm a big carry hit fan. Like, hit your starter button. And when we got on the podium, you were like, I was hitting my starter button. How did that happen? We had an electrical gremlin in the car. And for some reason, some of these times you go race after race and you don't have any issues. For some reason, Coda is when this thing started to raise its ugly head. And it would run fine for a while and then not run. And, you know, and we thought that we had it licked. We, we put a uh, new MSD unit in it. And for some reason, it just decided to stop. And I made it with, like you said, 100 feet of the line. I, I Did you burn out your starter? Did you get no, there? no, I didn't. I, I realized it was futile. It wouldn't go. And yeah. I, I figured, well, you know, why waste a, a good starter? <laughs> and yeah. so we, uh, I got, I thought about getting out and pushing. I thought, well, that probably wouldn't look very good anyway. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, disappointing to say yeah. the least. Lights out at 10, they said. They're in 10 right now. That's 10B. And uh, so we should be coming to a start. So, Jonathan, I hand it to the maestro. <laughs> Here we go, then, and let's look at the stories. What can Ernie Francis do from the restart? He's in third position. He's got one car to pass. He's already passed him. And now Ernie Francis Jr. is in third place overall behind Ragginger and the plaid car that leads this race. Ernie, uh, Tommy Dreesey is fired up to try to beat Ernie Francis Jr. Meanwhile, Ski is also running hard. We're on board with Greasy over the crest at two. And Francis is on the run. He's going to try to catch Martin as quickly as he can and see if he can challenge these two leaders who've been on their own for most of the race. But what a race from Ernie Francis Jr. Piled his way forward. Boris said also seventh place. He's going to try to get past Amy Ruman. We'll look for him as he comes over the hill. But Ernie's right there now. One, two, three for the grand finale. Dreesey and Ford. Mark, 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 Justin Marks is in fifth. Amy, Amy and Boris. Six and Boris. Boris may have worn out his tires uh, trying to catch up there because uh, he should be able to get around Amy quicker than that. We're watching Dreesey. We were on board with him then. Here comes Ernie, down the hill. What, two car lengths between them. Ragginger all over the back of Dyson as it's been all race long. Dyson looks good, though. He's not getting looks squirrely very good, anywhere. Yeah. This is the best I've seen out of Chris I Dyson all I think uh, Martin's getting a little bit frustrated, thinking that he'd show something by now. Martin Ragginger, who, of course, cut his teeth in karting on the Michael Schumacher track where Michael and Ralph began. So. Not a bad place to start oh, your career. Fitel, Here comes looking inside. On Cameron. Lawrence. Well, Lawrence was doing the maneuvers yesterday, but he can't quite make it stick, and Lawrence holds on. Man, these nice Pirelli boot. tires are impressive. That car should not be able to hold on like that. Well, Cameron doing is, it. is impressive. Cameron is one really good. driver. Yes, he is. And you couldn't find a nicer person. Yeah. Yeah, great driver. Does a lot for the sport. But, man, Franklin... Got a lot of time here. He knows the secrets of this track. Yeah. He just used one, too. He went really wide 
on the exit of five. And he's just got to tuck himself into a position where he can overtake. Next real opportunity is to get good drive out of this corner here and then dive bomb him at 10. Here we go. Borchetta, 24th. Justin Oaks down in 23rd. Lostowski still ahead of Lee Saunders by the looks of things. Saunders in 28. Griffin in 33rd, but he's our GT champion. All right, we should be for seven laps to go. Cameron Lawrence still trying to get on level terms with Mike Skeen. Now the four of them are really close together, and here comes Boris to join the party. He's got yep. past Amy Ruman. There's Mike Skeen. There's Cameron Lawrence. There's Fratrell. That's the battle in TA2. One, two, three. Yeah, I think Thomas Merrill had some mechanical issues and has fallen way back. But you know what I can't wait to see, Jonathan? Ernie Francis Jr. is catching up to Martin. Oh, I know. They haven't had a chance to race together, no. but I'm sure Martin is aware of Ernie's talent. Yeah, and it's... Oh, we're waving a local yellow at turn three for some reason. Probably, is that car still off of four? No? Uh, I don't know what that was. No, the car's There's a local yellow at three. I think there's a, a car on the side of the road. There's Lostowski. Let's see where Lee Saunders is. There he is. He's far back, but not far back in SGT. No. They, he's second in SGT, but he's got to get past this GT traffic if he's going to try to get past. We're on board with him now, and this is what he's dealing with through the S's. Kerry said it earlier, this is the worst place. There is a car stopped off. at yeah. three. Okay, but Lee Saunders is in it to win the championship. He'd like to win overall, but his primary goal is to win the championship. Yeah. So if he wrecks, he gives the championship to Adrian if Adrian finishes first. So right now, he's happy staying in second as long as he doesn't take unnecessary risks. Good point. Will he stay, if he stays in second, will he take the championship, though? He will, yeah. yeah. I think uh, Adrian has to win, and then he has to finish, like, fourth, I think, for Adrian mathematically to win it. Let's take a look at uh, Boris Said's time. He just did a 121.2, uh, and that was a lot quicker than Justin Marks, a 122.8 ahead of him, uh, but on a similar pace to Dreesey on a 121. Cameron's put a gap between he and Franklin Futrell, but, man, I have really been impressed with this driver we're looking at right now with that Joker paint scheme, the purple and green. Franklin Futrell, I hope he's with us in 2021 because I, I feel like he could run for a championship. Well, he took five years off and was getting bored with all the COVID, sitting at home, and he went, right, I'm going racing. Yeah, he's racing an M1 chassis. Great onboard shots of Cameron Lawrence in his favorite office. And putting on a master class as well. And the onboard really give you a chance to see the driver as he tightens his belts there, heading towards six, back down the gearbox. Just fettling it, gets a little oversteer the tires. Kerry, tell me about the tires now with five to go. How do they feel? Tires, well, uh, they had a little chance to cool down because uh, they uh, because of the yellow. So I, I think that the cars ought to be sticking pretty well. Of course, they're low on fuel too. so. They uh, with the, I'm not sure about the TA2, but I know we have a sway bar adjustment, and we can adjust for the fuel load. And that makes it uh, handle a little bit better. We're on board with Doug Peterson as he heads under the bridge at the Motel Bridge, down towards eight and nine. Jonathan, I don't know about you, but I'm loving this insight from Trans Am legend Kerry Hit. Kerry, if you ever get to retirement age, why don't you consider coming in the booth with us and being a commentator? Well. I'll be 74 tomorrow, so I don't know. Really? <laughs> Happy birthday. That's amazing. Oh, thank you. That's Franklin. Oh, Franklin Futrell off. He probably went, look, judging by the smoke, he went off at 10A through the gravel yeah. Yeah. and ended up in the Formula Drift track. And that could put us under a double caution again unless he gets into the starting. Let's hope he does. We want to see a, uh, a green checker flag, but uh, we could end up with the caution. But this has been an absolute humdinger. Really good start as Peterson heads back up the hill. Road Atlanta, finale of Trans Am 2020. There will be a sigh of relief from one John Claggett at the end of this race, and you will be able to hear it across Georgia because he's put on a hell of a show. He hasn't slept for eight months. He's kept us on course. He's kept us in racing. He's kept us in cyberspace, and he's promoted the series brilliantly. Yeah. It's been a hell of a year, and I say take my hat off to everybody involved in the series put this show on under these circumstances fantastic well said yeah agreed Cameron Lawrence still fighting Doug Peterson still fighting yeah, that was Doug teammate. Peterson with Barry Bowes yeah right Barry there Bowes there's a car Texas. off to the right after seven the exit of seven there's cars off to the right 
not in the line, so hopefully we can stay under uh, local yellow there instead of a full course yellow. That's our leader, Chris Dyson. Well, pulled a gap Dyson has got this. Ahead of Ernie. Go. Oh, tracy has got Ernie. Oh, that's going to end in tears soon. Uh, here comes Rafa as well. Wow, what a way to finish. I tell you what, Dreesy will be well satisfied to beat the champion. But uh, you know that Ernie's going to come back at him. I tell you, Dreesy's now going to go after Martin Raginger as well. That's his teammate. Yeah, I saw the corner worker at seven holding out the white flag, meaning slow vehicles ahead. But uh, it must have been there for a oh, while. Oh, Gugliotti. They black bagged him about 100 times, and he's still going. It's like out of a Monty Python sketch. <laughs> it's just a flash wound. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> I'm all right. If he keeps ignoring black flags, this might be the last time we see him on track with us. You can't do that. That makes uh, no. race control very upset in Trans Am as Dyson goes down the front stretch, passing Lee Saunders the, with his SGT oh, car, followed so by tough. Billy Griffin yeah, in this that is GT so championship. Yeah, this is so tough for Chris. I mean, you know, he's having to fight hard against Martin, but look, this is what happens. While he's trying to go but, fast, you know, he's just playing into yeah, ragging. But he's got to be Lee patient. Saunders is slowing, is he? Yes. What's happened to Lee? Everybody's passing him. Yeah, he's letting the leaders go. Okay. He's doing the right thing. Good job, Lee Saunders. Thank you. Okay, good. So he's letting Ernie, who's all over the back of Greasy, you're watching him from Saunders' position. Thank you for the camera work, Lee. Bob Lima there in that white TA2 car, getting passed by Chris Dyson. Bob's in a TA2 oh. car. Ooh. And look at this coming into six. Our oh, man Tom doing the business. Nicely done. And here comes Ernie side by side through seven for a minute. Who's going to get the better drive? Kerry, your call. I think Greasy's going to get him on this. All right. They've still got to deal with traffic. Ernie got a little offline. He wasn't yeah, able okay. to apex it quite right, so he lost some speed coming okay. out of there. So we're going to have white flag this time by. One lap to go when they cross the start finish line. Down the hill they come. There is nothing between them. Great racing. Over the hill they come to start what should be the last lap. The white flag is out. Here's Greasy about to take it. There's the leader. That's the TA battle. This is the battle for the podium. And Greasy in the Lucas Slickness car. Just ahead in the number eight of Ernie Francis Jr. In the Florida... One South Florida car, and he is all over him now. Surely Ernie's going to make a move, but where, Kerry? Six. I turn six. Thinking he's not going to have maybe maybe five or uh, six. Yeah, I agree. Six, six or ten. Yeah, that's it. It I looks agree. like he's looking at six. He looks faster, doesn't right. he? I don't know, though. He wasn't well, getting them. I must have been. Uh-oh, traffic. question we heard on the radio that... Uh, Greasy's got the pit between his teeth. It's not going to be six, but there's traffic coming into seven. But let's give it up for Chris Dyson. This is a flag-to-flag -flag oh, victory brilliant. if Absolutely. he can just finish this half a lap. One of his best results of the, of the year, and not uh, certainly one of the best races of his career, without a doubt, up against a former factory Porsche driver. Now, Greasy, can he hold off Francis? This is the final lap of the final race of the 2020 season. Chris Dyson is going to turn around his year by taking the win if he does everything right. But can Ernie Francis Jr. make one last gasp? I don't think so. And here nope. comes the winner to take the checkered flag. Dyson does it in style and hoovers it all up. Nicely done. Ragiger is second. And Tommy Dreesey holds on for third. Great racing throughout. And Tommy Dreesey, hats off to him. He was riled up. Yeah. And Kerry, I know you wanted to be there, but did you enjoy at least watching? I did. I did. <laughs> it, 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 the, the adrenaline high is not quite as no. good, but it was, it was pretty good. Gets you know? me going. <laughs> you know, Chris's, Chris's team has worked really hard, and they had a lot of crazy setbacks, so it's really well, great to see him get Dyson's out there. Well, you'll know the very well. Just give us a perspective on how he sits in motor racing terms, because he comes from a racing family. Oh, he comes, yeah, his racing family, uh, I, his father raced. Uh, uh, Chris has been around racing forever. They, they bring a tremendous amount to the sport. Their effort is second to none. Uh, and he's a super gentleman too. He Very is a nice gentleman. Guy. Oh, absolutely. And he got he missed Lime Rock because it was cancelled, which is his, his his home race. That was his home race. Yep, yep. I remember him winning up at the Lime Rock, and boy, he was just as happy as could be. His family was up on the podium, and uh, but uh, 
the whole Trans Am family is is just one that uh, it, it's hard to find words to describe what it's like unless you actually see it. But you know, and, and it's tentacle spread. You know, you could imagine Bill Elliott sat at home with Chase today, maybe for Thanksgiving, but probably watch it. Yeah. Because both of them have, 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 have been around Trans Am. Yeah. Bill, of course, was racing, what, just a couple of years ago? Yeah. Uh, just as a one-off. But yeah. it doesn't matter. Um, we see Paul Tracy. We see uh, Boris said coming back. I mean, that's the beauty of Trans Am. It, it's loved by racing American racers all over. Well, the, the format that they have uh, is, is second to none. I mean, you, you can get out there and you can race. And you can race hard and, and you, you know what to expect. And uh, I, I think, uh, I really think that the... A lot of NASCAR drivers ought to look at Trans Am just to come in and, and try it because once you do it, I'll tell you what, you'll never go back. You know, it's interesting. I mentioned that Martin Raginger was a, uh, a former Porsche a, a Porsche factory driver. Well, Earl Bamba, of course, one of the top Porsche drivers in the world right now, had an Xfinity run at Daytona uh, yeah. earlier this year, the New Zealander. And I said, you know what? If you really want to get into NASCAR, come and join us for a couple of weekends and get you, you know, yeah, get you get yourself uh, dialed in, so to speak. So Chris Dyson finishes 2020 on an absolute high, a superb race, one of the best I've seen him race ever because he was under pressure for the entire 100 miles. Martin Raginger uh, put on a great show too. There was nothing between them. Tommy Dreesy deserves everything he got out of that race because to beat the champion. When it was all on the line yesterday, he will go home back to California with some pride after that run. Uh, Boris said, making it up to fifth place behind Ernie Francis Jr. having spun on the first lap. Justin Mark, six. Amy Ruman, seven. Simon Gregg in eighth position. And then the first of the TA2s. And somewhat appropriately, Mike Skeen wins ahead of Cameron Lawrence. Those two battling it out. But uh, kudos to Jet Nolan, the youngster, taking third in TA2 uh, behind... Keith Prochuk in 12th position. Not an easy weekend for Keith. He made it from the back to six yesterday and now gets a 12th overall and a third fourth in TA2 today. Great stuff. And well done to JP Southern. He was in the gravel earlier this weekend, but he uh, comes back to, what, 13th place. Well, hopefully, we've sent Ben down there and hopefully we'll hear from the man who just put on a Trans Am Masterclass. Kerry, you're impressed with that, right? did a great job. I think they saved the best for last yes. for this race. I mean, it was really exciting. So uh, I really appreciate you inviting me up in here, and, and it's been fun doing it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. No, not at all, Kerry. Kerry, one of the legends of Trans Am, and he'll be bringing that C8 silhouette into action. There's our winner, the number 20 Ford Mustang of Chris Dyson. And as soon as he gets that helmet off, Ben Sissel will grab him. In fact, I can see him running towards him now. He's congratulating everybody. What a wonderful scene from high above on the drone. Great camera work, guys. Well done. Fantastic race. And there is Ben. Ben, I'm going to let you, you let you go and talk to Chris Mr. Dyson. Dyson. Thanks, Jonathan. Chris Dyson, we're here with the winner from, from flag to flag. How in the world did you do it? And I just took a lap around your car. Multi-class racing. I know you're well experienced. We got to get a mask on, Chris. You guys, Dyson Racing. But Chris, how in the world can you run in multi-class racing like that? Good job, Martin. How can you run like that? Well, I'll tell you what. We had to pull out every trick in my experience book around this place today. Uh, it was really hard racing. Martin was on me the whole way, and uh, you know I had to basically use all the tools in the kit today uh, with all the traffic out there. Uh, he was keeping me honest. Uh, I, I have to say though. After yesterday, this is, sure feels good to go home with a win under our belt. This is the second year in a row we've closed out the finale with a win. So I'm really stoked about that. Winning in Atlanta, amazing. Happy for Plaid, happy for my family who's home. Love you guys. And uh, it's been a tough year, but it's nice to close it out this way. It, it really has really been a tough year. But Chris, so impressive. Flag to flag, such multi-class racing. Nice job. Congratulations. Winning here at Michelin Road, Atlanta. Where do we want to go next, Tony? Oh. Hey, drivers, put on your masks. Ben's getting amongst it. Who have you got now, Ben? 
Well, I can see them running around. Where is Ernie? I'm looking. View, but, so uh, we're bringing all the cars down yeah, here at the end of the race. Looking for Ernie Francis Jr. Hey, hey, he's right back here. Ernie, <laughs> tell me about this race out there. That was a crazy <laughs> battle. Yeah, it was a really uh, tough race. Uh, having to start from the back, I uh, had to really work our way through. We knew once we uh, took the green flag, we had the championship locked up. So uh, really was pressure off of us at that point, just trying to uh, race and have some fun out there. And uh, yeah, had a lot of fun in that race. Uh, was trying to battle for the for the podium. Just didn't have uh, didn't have the the car for it today. But uh, yeah, we'll be back next year and uh, we'll come take home another championship. Hey, Jeff. That was some of the best racing. Yeah. I mean, you, you were probably saying, man, I hope he doesn't spin because we're both being in trouble. <laughs> yeah, All right, we're gonna go talk to Cameron Lawrence. Cameron Lawrence, coming to you. Put your mask on. Cameron <laughs> Lawrence. Ben is like a he's like a sergeant major in the British Army, isn't he? Here we go. Tell me about your race out there. Cameron Lawrence has got a great story. Uh, it was a good race. Um, you know, it's uh, not the cleanest of racing. You know, the car's pretty torn up again uh, due to just some TA traffic and uh, trying to race clean. But, but yeah, very exciting race. It was good to lead some laps. Uh, thought we had a really good car the first half of the race and then kind of lost the rear tires towards the end there. So, again, we had a good car, not the best car out here. So, you know, we, we tried to hang with Mike the best we could and sort through the traffic and uh, another second place finish. So proud of these guys for all the hard work they did. That's it. Nice. Cameron Lawrence, thank you so much. We're going to try to find Lee Saunders. Where is Lee Saunders? Lee Saunders I see Logan. GT. I see Adrian Las Tosas. Here he is. Hey, Lee, put a mask on. Coming, coming, All right, we're coming to Lee Saunders in this beautiful V10. Lakeland Speed and Custom Dodge Viper. Lee, tell us about this race and mathematically, where do you think you finish in the championship? Uh, I think that was enough. Uh, um, uh, first of all, I just, I, I got to thank my crew. Uh, Kevin with KSR, Jamie with Lakeland Speed. We had uh, uh, Jeremy come up. We had Drew come up. We had uh, Travis English come up to help us. They worked their rears off the last two races. Uh, I think we've swapped everything out but the driver, and maybe we should have done that. I don't know, but uh, they've just worked uh, their, their rears off this whole season to get us where we were. I can't thank my guys enough, but, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously Adrian, uh, heartbreak for him because he's been a fantastic competitor. Um, I hated to see that. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> this guy is awesome right here. This How about this camaraderie? Adrian, we spoke this morning, and you told me, I think you said it was nine points away, and you were wanting to do it. You did everything you could, but Lee did everything he could to win the championship. But how does it feel? Uh, well, you know, we're happy with, we, you know, we got this far. The team worked so hard. We want to thank our sponsors, Hawk, Performance, Forge Line Wheels. We, during the race, we uh, got caught up there a little bit at the start, and I spun out, so, like, kind of disappointing to my team, but whatever. But, you know, we caught back up, but, you know, it was what it was, and congratulations to Lee. There's nobody better that could win this race, the championship, than Lee, you know, so. Uh, I don't know about that. This guy's awesome, and uh, I think he's going TA2 racing next year, so those guys better work out because he is a hell of a driver and a fantastic guy. Nice. I love it. Lee Saunders, Adrian Lostowski, the camaraderie here in the Trans Am field, the big family, really fun to watch. Jonathan Green, I'm going to give it back to you. We're going to do the podium celebration. Thanks a lot, everybody. Nice work, Ben, as always. And Kerry, I think we just got the perfect example of what you were saying throughout the race. You know, those guys went at it. Lee Saunders and Adrian Lostoski, as they did in all the categories. But the point is, look at the joy. Look at the friendship. Look at the camaraderie. That's Trans Am. Exactly. It's the experience. Uh, it's being able to go out there and be as absolutely competitive as you could possibly believe. And then still come back in and, and shake hands and be friends. Uh, Maybe the world should take a lesson for that. What do you think? I, you know, and also I think motor racing has been a fantastic example across the world this year. Yeah. We are in the middle of a very, very troubling time for the whole world. Motor racing is a business like any other, uh, but it's a family and it's a disciplined family that knows how to react to safety and to discipline and to doing the right thing and doing things properly. That's how with NASCAR, how IndyCar, Formula One, Trans Am has managed to go racing because we understand there are rules and we 
work within the rules, and we have fun within the rules. Absolutely, and everybody rises to the occasion to do the best they can. I mean, it shows, gives you an opportunity to show you're striving for excellence, uh, which everybody does when they're out there, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's a great sport. I'm, I, I couldn't ever imagine myself doing anything else. Yep. Well, Kerry Hitt, who's been alongside me, is one of the doyens of Trans Am. And uh, even though he is 74 young tomorrow, <laughs> he's already looking to the future. Uh, what else besides the CA? Anything else? Yes, we have a uh, the 2021 version of the Camaro. Uh, we redid the front. Uh, our our uh, designer, Chris Eldridge, uh, is a fellow who does all the stuff in computer. And we sit down and he, he, he works the computer. And I say, well, put this here and put that there. And then we kind of work together and then bounce it off of each other. We came up with a really nice design for the new Camaro. Uh, Going to be some new things aero-wise for the cars for next year. So with, with the Corvette and, and the, the new Camaro and the, the Challenger, they're all going to get a little bit of uh, aero upgrades. So uh, we try to make them just a little bit better every year. So that's what we're going to strive for. And it's, uh, you know, looking towards the future. I mean, hopefully we'll just get out of this uh, pandemic. But 21 is looking, I mean, looking at the schedule. I mean, it's bigger and better, isn't it? Have a lot of races, uh, 14 races in the schedule. Uh, we we want to, hopefully, they've got a lot of races. Hopefully we're going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, uh, if, if not, at least uh, we have a better chance of making the ones that we want to get to. Well, there's a confirmation of the result. Chris Dyson wins. Martin Ragginger in second place. Tommy Dreesey in third. Ernie Francis Jr. in fourth place. Boris said in fifth. Justin Marks in sixth place. Amy Room in seventh. Simon Gregg eighth. And Mike Skeen in ninth position. Tenth, Cameron Lawrence in the three-dimensional services group. And further down, Jet Noland. Keith Prochuk, John Paul Southern Jr. in 13th, Richard Grant 14th, Barry Bowes, Peterson, Tommy Sheen, Morris Hull, Rafa Matos in the end, finishing just ahead of Scott Borchetta. That's the top 20 in our amazing all-class feature race. And I've been told that down in the pits is the man I've been wanting to talk to for a while. And that, of course, is John Claggett. John Claggett is the president of Trans Am, and he has been working so hard to put this series together. Take it away, John. He's with our producer. John Claggett, what a season. Just a quick word to end the season. Well, can you see I'm smiling? No, <laughs> it's that kind of year, but uh, a lot of challenges, but uh, what a great way to finish the year. A nice race today. Great races yesterday a perfect weekend in Atlanta so thanks very much back to you Johnny great stuff lol and thank you John Claggett um, he has been under immense pressure to put this on we missed um, Laguna Seca which was due to be held obviously in two weeks time this became our finale and we, we just literally Watkins Glen was cancelled we went and had a double header at VIR that's a huge organizational thing uh, and Kerry I think we're all taking our hat off to, to what John's achieved uh, yes uh, he did a great job at, at, at least pulling together making the best of what we had left and uh, a lot of last minute decisions but uh, I, we, we feel, I feel like we have a season in. Okay, well, as the podium gets underway and the voice of Ben Sissel pounds out, my thanks to Kerry Hit, my thanks to Trans Am, one and all. This has been the Trans Am series presented by Pirelli. More action coming up on our live stream, so don't go away because SVRA is still coming up. But uh, we'll take a short break. We'll be back with more from Road Atlanta after this. Getting the most out of your Classic can mean many things. That's why Hecott Classic Insurance is excited to sponsor the Trans Am Race Series. In addition to events, we have proudly provided insurance for race cars, classic cars, and exotic cars since 1989. Hecott Classic is known for its famous agreed-upon value, where brokers and clients find common ground on coverage. So make sure to get your quote today. Follow us at hashtag HecockDriven. 
Lightweighting means reducing mass and consolidating parts. No one tackles these design and tooling challenges better than three-dimensional services. We'll provide flexible tooling solutions, including integrating parts, reducing design complexity, or even design changes. We're the go-to source for rapid manufacturing and low-volume production. Trust three-dimensional services to develop the most efficient approach to meet your lightweighting challenges today. Three-dimensional services. Prototype. Production. Proven. So, welcome back to Road Atlanta, and as you can see, nothing changes. We are back at it. This is the SVRA. This is group one, two, three, and four, as they head out. And that beautiful little Lotus leading the way. Little Brug Eye Sprites and a Datsun involved in this one, too. And... It's a little bit uh, more of a, a splendid play, pace at the moment, or a quieter pace, but uh, these guys are going after it, that's for sure. And these cars are from the late 60s and early 70s, and we've got quite a smorgasbord of cars out there in this one. This is their second feature race of the weekend, and didn't tune in yesterday, you are watching the SBRA Vintage National Championship. We have several groups in action. They had one race yesterday and another today. I'm just picking up Robert Bowden is the man leading the way at the moment. Daniel Becker also out there. He's in a crossly. The Lotus 23B of Randall Green is the man we were focusing on. There he is. There's the 48. That's Robert Bowden. He's now in second place to uh, Daniel Decker. Uh, to sorry to Randall uh, Green and uh, Daniel Decker. Oh, and we've got somebody in the gravel trap. That's car number five. That's Michael Hibbs. Sadly. Currently eighth overall, but no, that's going to be coming to naught because I don't think he's going to get out of there. It doesn't look as though he's going to get out of there. That uh, could slow things down a bit as we look at the 71 of David Becker, uh, Daniel Becker, excuse me, in the Crossley 32F from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Oh, and another spin. So these guys have been perhaps waiting a little too long and they're getting a little bit over jealous, but over zealous about their uh, attempts. Gregory Hibbs going round. So Mitchell and Gregory Hibbs in trouble. That's the Merlin 20A from Tyler, Texas going round. But still out front, it's the Lotus. Number 13 is a cracker, Andrew McLean, who was in a good battle. The two Austin Healy's, the Bug Eye Sprite and the Austin Healy Sprite yesterday, though these two you're looking at now, had a fantastic battle yesterday. And uh, I think they'll do the same again today. They don't get that much time on track in terms of laps because there's so many groups and so many interested parties in SBRA. I think we've got something like 360 cars alone this weekend. We had over 400 cars at the Circuit of the Americas some two weeks ago. And of course, SVRA run by Tony Perella, who also owns Trans Am and now has the commercial rights for uh, the Formula Regional and Formula Four uh, championships. So it's becoming quite a uh, diverse group of um, championships under his tutelage, as it were. And I can see the safety car coming out now, so we'll slow things down again because we've got two cars stuck at the gravel and we need to remove them. And because these cars are literally, there's one of them, that's uh, Mitchell Hibbs, and the other one is on the other side of the track. So uh, we'll get them going, and uh, we'll slow things down a bit here. But uh, yeah, uh, these are priceless cars, so we don't want any harm to come to them. And luckily, uh, both of them have just uh, parked it in the gravel and just had a, a rather dainty spin. Cooler day than yesterday, and a little bit cloudier too. And I think that's a bit of a respite, because you expect November to be much cooler than it is, but uh, we've had some really inclement weather in terms of it's 
been mid 70s, almost 80 degrees, and uh, absolutely gorgeous. So we're under caution here in what is our group one, two, three, and four SVRA coverage. This their finale as well, and uh, pretty much end of the season now for motor racing. Macau going on this weekend, and they too struggling with COVID in terms of participation. So everybody's had to adjust this year. But Petit Le Mans uh, was run. Sebring was run just a couple of weeks ago, or last week, excuse me. And so, and of course, the Indy 500 managed to get away, although all at different times than they usually do during the year. So everybody, including John Claggett, who you heard from, and Tony Perella, who runs this series, have had to adjust. But uh, they've done it incredibly well, to be fair. And it just shows you how much these guys love to race because they are determined, despite the uh, situation, to go racing and do what they love. And I say, here's to them. If you're wondering, yes, uh, the RVs are here, but there is a, a crowd here per se. Uh, it's mostly RVs. They are selling tickets to the uh, car show that's up there. We've got some exotic cars on display. But everybody coming into the facility is, uh, has a temperature check and an arm wrist band to identify the fact that they have no temperature and they have no fever at this time. And that's a very important factor. Everybody's wearing masks, as you've seen. And um, it's, it's, just, it's just now just a norm, I'm afraid. But uh, we are sticking to it and we are going to keep that discipline going. Otherwise, we will not be able to bring you this show. And wherever you're watching it, watching this coverage we hope that you stay safe and we all get through this together so we're under safety here in our group one and it's uh, Randall Green who leads the way ahead of Daniel Becker in the cross leap and as you see on the bottom of your screen as it flies through let me go through some of the cars again like I said most of these cars from the late 60s. There is one 90, well, two 1958 Austin Healey, so it even goes further back than that. But most of them are 60s and early 70s car. We've got a couple of Merlins out there. Uh, we've got that uh, Lotus Super 7 also from Gulfport, Florida. And it looks as though we are hearing from race control that there is oil down on the track, which is why these cars were spinning. And that, I think, is going to bring out the black flag. And I, yes, I can see it now from my position. So shame, but uh, you do not want, there is the black flag. You do not want to race these priceless cars when there is oil on track. And we've had two spins. So until they get that sorted out, we are black flag. So all the cars will come in and they'll either give them another run when we've cleared it up or we'll go on to the next group but uh, as you can see no drama really and here they are all coming in in fact they're coming right at me because I'm just above uh, where they are coming to in the tower that you'll see in a moment there it is the Michelin Raceway Tower and a resplendent new building here just talking to Dave Miller who uh, is the technician here and it's a beautiful new facility for Road Atlanta and it has given the whole place a real facelift and it's a state-of-the-art hospitality, communications, media center, commentary booths, and you can see that roof hospitality. It's got TVs and everything. It's a really, really super facility. So that uh, pretty much put paid to our group one, two, three, and four feature race two, unfortunately. Uh, we may get going again. They're coming into the pre-grid, so maybe they'll get back out again. But um, perhaps uh, if they get the oil cleared away, maybe we'll get out again. But we've got action coming up. We've got several more races uh, this afternoon um, throughout the afternoon. So as they come to a complete stop under a black flag situation while we clean up the oil, we'll take a short break here. We'll be right back. One of the focuses of this program is not only building a car, but we're building the entire student. Making can only happen if you do it on your own. It's all about project-based learning. Take it out, straw it up. How do we 
build a team. Winter Circle benefits my students in multiple ways. It starts off with teamwork, and it's not just a standard, here's the facts, spit it back, school. It's a product that you generate that has to be worked on until it's right, not until it's done. I really see the students engaging in ways that we have not seen before. The Winter Circle allows us to work more as a team rather than individuals to create something bigger. When we do like all these tasks and hands-on stuff, I understand it more. We've been looking a long time at how the middle class has been shrinking and how there's been a problem with people just going to college and not knowing what they want to do. We really want to be able to bring entrepreneurship and trades back into middle America. This opportunity goes so far beyond the school year. It's about opening the door to a world of possibilities. The world of science, technology, engineering, the arts and math, all of these things are available and it shows up every single day. Right now in my life, I don't really have something that I'm focused on to go to. And this project allows me to become like who I want to be when I grow up. A circle has no beginning and it has no end. It's the ultimate symbol of teamwork. And that's a philosophy that we really want our students to leave and go out into the workforce with. It's not just what can they get for themselves, but what can they give back. Please visit winners-circle.org to help support our team and get a Winner's Circle project to your school. The Winner's Circle Project, uh, a really good and worthy charity there. As we look high above the uh, Road Atlanta circuit, I've got a great story for you because we brought you the Brabhams. Jeff Brabham and his son raced at Circuit of the Americas. So it was Matt or Matthew Brabham and Jeff Brabham racing in SVRA. Well, this weekend, they're not racing against each other, but Boris said, who you saw in action a moment ago, has his son here, Boris said, junior, just 16 years of age, and he is racing a Miata. We had to catch up with them both. What a weekend, what a motorsport. Boris Sand takes victory at the Circuit of the Americas. Well, Boris, after a, a lifetime of probably listening about your father's career and being around it, you're taking the plunge. You're having to go yourself. I mean, about two years ago, I just, like, decided I wanted to start go-kart racing, and now I'm here. So I decided I wanted to do it one day. Now, is the old man a help or a hindrance? He knows what he's doing, but does he want to help you, or does he just want to leave you alone? He's pretty helpful. Like I, I think he kind of knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I was excited because, you know, it's something that I love to do, and, and so it's cool that he loves to do it, and, and I never really pushed him to it. You know, early on when he was born, I think I bought him a dirt bike when he was like three months old, and my wife was like, you're a little early, and you know, and it looked like he didn't want to do stuff like that for a long time, and then all of a sudden one day, I want a dirt bike, and we were dirt biking. About, about I've always been racing dirt bikes, and about two years ago, I just decided I wanted to try outdoor go-karting, and yeah. I don't really know why, I just decided I wanted to try. And he tried it and loved it, so... You know, I know since I got bit by the bug, I can see it in somebody when they get bit by the bug. And, you know, he's definitely got a lot of talent and uh, he definitely has a passion for it. So, you know, we're having a lot of fun doing it together. I mean, he sort of just like, he didn't force me into it or he didn't like push me away from me. He sort of said, you know, you, if you want to do it, you can. But he's definitely like supportive and helpful about it. This is my second time ever on track. Originally, like a, about two weeks ago, I did a test day at Buttonville in California. And, Thanks to Tony Perella, he rented me a car, and here I am just doing this race weekend here for SVRA. So can I get a world exclusive and say that there is another Boris said on the way for American racing? Ah, there is another Boris said on the way for American racing. If I come back in another life, I want to be a Boris Said Jr. too. What a great family and what a great story too. And congratulations. He is, as my dad would say, a chip off the old block. So we're looking down and as you can see, the car's still uh, in our group one, two, three and four parked up because we've had oil on the track here in our SVRA coverage. So we just wait for the resumption, hopefully, of that. And it's it's good that uh, they're still in their cars and still gridded up because it means that they're hoping to get back out again because there's a busy schedule here, but there is enough room to hopefully uh, give them time to get out on track. And we've got uh, 
Although we've got a busy schedule, um, we're supposed to be finishing around 4 p.m. local. So there's still about an hour, an hour and a half of uh, sunlight uh, between 4 and 5.30. There you see what's happening now live. Um, they're just checking the track for where the oil is. And it's almost more critical in vintage racing than in modern day racing to deal with the oil because like I said a lot of these cars are quite literally priceless uh, and so you really do want to do the best you can to give them the opportunity to to go racing cleanly uh, and without any distractions and you saw two cars uh, unmistakably spinning around quite heavily and here's the scene down in the grid as they get ready Safety car has been busy this weekend doing its business, doing its job. And like I said, this is well, it's quite an interesting grid, quite an eclectic grid. Robert Bowden had a Brabham BT29 out there earlier this week. I'm not sure if he's uh, actually taken to the grid for this one, but uh, that was a nice car to see. Now, on the bottom of your screen is where the Trans Ams prepare their car. And then the top is where SVRA. Uh, some of them are staying for Sunday. Some of them just doing the Saturday racing. And so it depends. And, of course, they come from far and wide. What amazes me is whatever state we're in, just how many historic cars. So it looks as though we're going to go out again. And here we go. There's the number 63. Randall Green in that green Lotus 23B from Boca Raton, Florida. Really pretty car, that too. 71, that's Daniel Becker in the Crossley 32 from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. His old belt helmet on. 2F Racing, that's where the uh, F2 comes from. There's the yellow and blue with those bug eyes. They're great, aren't they? We saw a whole, at our hotel last night, there was a whole bunch of MGs talking of British heritage. And uh, they really are a sight to see. Those are really small cars, but boy, can they pedal. They're, they're great to drive. I had an MG as a kid growing up, and they were just so much fun. Scott Fraser, the Austin Healy Sprite from Woodstock, Georgia. So not that far away. We've got an MG Midget out there as well. And there you see the cleanup going on. Now, how quickly they're on it. Uh, they're putting down the dry dust. Now, that basically dries the oil, and then they brush over it to effectively kind of, sort of pat it down. It's, it's like a cake at this point. And uh, it does a really good job. I'm amazed. I talked to some of the drivers. We've had a couple of these incidents this weekend. We had one at the critical breaking point of turn 10. And I said to some of the drivers afterwards, you know, how was the next lap? And he said, you know what? It, it was like it never happened. I saw the dust, but uh, it was like it never happened. So it's, a, it's amazing stuff. You know, about the only modern things in these cars are the belt straps, quite rightly, because you need modern belt straps and safety belts. And everything else is as close to when they were designed. And in this case, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, that's literally the classic position for a racing driver. There's no way to put your hands when they're not on the wheel. Alex Fraser in the 77 MG Midget. And it is just that. How could you have a car smaller than an MGB? Well, you can. An MG Midget, beautiful car. Very lightweight. Ah, look at this Datsun. Lovely. An SRL 311. Datsun from 1967. Less. Almost as old as me. And our driver, Thomas Phelan from Hendersonville, North Carolina. Has a look at the dials. Thanks, Tony. So a nice little 
I actually quite enjoy it when we have a delay because we get a closer look at the cars uh, and a chance to look at them. And by the way, if you were wondering whether you're tuning in, if you're in America or you're tuning in in the United States and you want to come and join us, take a look at our 14 race calendar next year because it is a cracker. We are going all over America and if you want to see these cars up close, you are welcome. Um, SVRA is very, very inclusive. Come and meet the drivers, meet the mechanics, sit in the car if, if you want to. Uh, and hey, you can make an entry if you want to. But we are starting at Sebring in Florida next year. We'll be a homestead, we're back to back. So if you want to make a holiday in February in uh, Florida, you can do that. And then we'll go to Charlotte Motor Speedway with SBRA. That's going to be fun in March on the Roval. That means Roval and, uh, or Road Course and Oval. We then go back here to Road Atlanta at the end of March. And then Sonoma and WeatherTech Laguna Seca back to back in April and May. Always a nice time to go to California. And then the classic at Lime Rock uh, Memorial Weekend. And that's been in the calendar for many a year. Uh, Mid-Ohio, Road America, another two sort of back-to-back -back races back in uh, similar parts of the world. Road America, obviously, in Wisconsin. Mid-Ohio, obviously, in Ohio. And then we go to Brainerd in Minnesota, not far away. And we also go to Canada, and that's back-to-back, -back effectively, with Watkins Glen. Uh, and, of course, Watkins Glen, uh, pretty close to the Canadian Tire Motorsports Park. So, again, back-to-back -back events. Then VIR, Circuit of the Americas. Uh, so there's so much going on, and it looks as though these guys are going to effectively do a safety car lap. Whether they get to do one sprint lap, I don't know. We'll find out in a moment. But they haven't got their money's worth out of this race, but uh, it doesn't matter. It's a chance to run. And the autumn leaves falling on the track now. It's gone a little bit chilly over the last hour or so. The sun's dipped in, the clouds started to form. There is that Datsun from 1967. It was interesting talking to Ben how when you look at the back of this car, it looks like an MG. And that was very much true of what Datsun were all about. They, they, they took the design features of the British cars and said, we like what they do, but we want to see the muscle from the American cars. And so they came over to America, did Datsun, and raced these sorts of cars back in the late 60s to much effect because they did take the best of both. Uh, and that made it really interesting because the racing back then was obviously up against the big bore Camaros, Mustangs, and so on. But uh, Datsun and the Japanese manufacturers started to infiltrate a little bit. The Europeans had already been there with their Porsches and their Minis and their Sprites and their MGs. Corvairs and the Corvettes took them on. So that Datsun is a really good example of what the Japanese reacted to in terms of their manufacture for going racing. So we're going to get a one lap dash across the line they come and it is the Lotus that leads as the field spreads out. Not a big field but it doesn't matter. What a bit of a lock up there by the number 13, Andrew McLean in the Austin Healy. As they climb up the hill and start to spread out. You can see the dust from the oil that was down. And they'll probably be just going a little gingerly through this uh, section just to check that they don't spin the cars. A lot of dust flying up. And obviously most of these are open wheelers, so you'll get lots of dust in your visor. And now it cleans up again as they approach turn five. Ah, beautiful sound. Alex Fraser heading down towards turn six now. And side by side into six. Someone's got to give. <laughs> I said that, they didn't. And I think the back, the, the Datsun, the Tom, Thomas Phelan, just happy to stay at the back and let them fight it out. He's happy as he ran seven and down the long run, letting the uh, horsepower go. Most of these, what, ah, some of them over 1,000, but most of them 1,600s. The Datsun, um, a two-liter. I think if I was going to go historic racing, 
would love to do an open wheeler like this and see what it was like for, or how hard it was for the guys in the day to drive one of these machines with very simple suspension and not a lot of aid. So last lap, here we go. It was a two lap sprint and it looks like we got a race on. At the moment, Robert Bowden leads in the Brabham. Daniel Becker in the Cross League 32F. And then this battle between the number 13 and the number 79. That's Andrew McLean in the 13 and Scott Fraser. They've been battling all weekend long in their Bug Eye Sprites and the Austin Healy Sprite. Both Austin Healy's, of course, but uh, just slightly different, you can see. But as Ben likes to point out, you can tell they're smiling. That grill is just so cute. How can, how can you not want to drive one of those? Might not be good on a rough, dusty road, but it's perfect for here. Now, Daniel Becker under pressure now in second place. Now, I think we might have some overtaking down the back straight with these two. And high above the road Atlanta circuit. Talking of history, this circuit opened in 1970, and they've been holding continuous races here ever since, both cars and bikes. They've done bike racing here, too. It's just as exciting. Vic Elford, the first winner of the first ever race here. And here they come then to the checkered flag under the bridge here at Road Atlanta. And it will be the Lotus 23B of Randall Green from Boca Raton who takes the checkered flag. Robert Bowden taking second place. And Daniel Becker rounding out the top three. And that battle went all the way, but it was Andrew McLean who held off Scott Fraser to the end and I think the Datsun will bring up the rear so a slightly slower pace here from the frenetic pace of Trans Am but I think it's a, a needed respite as across the line comes the Datsun of Thomas Phelan so well done to the number 63 now they'll put that on ice or at least put it in the truck I wonder what the founders of Lotus would have thought all these years on that these cars would still be relevant and still be racing. Great part of history. Just waving and thanking the marshals as well. No real crowd here this weekend, although as you can see on the hill there, quite a lot of RVs just coming to enjoy the weekend here. Randall Green then in the Lotus 23B wins from Robert Bowden in the Brabham BT29. The Crossley 32F of Daniel Becker was third. Andrew McLean beat Scott Fraser in the two battles between the Austin Healy's. Scott Fraser behind in fifth place. The Datsun of Thomas Phelan in sixth and then Alex Fraser in the MG Midget. Gregory Hibbs, Mitchell Hibbs, they were involved in that incident sadly uh, with the oil and Leo Basile in the Cooper finishes 10th. So that finishes their weekend of group one, two, three, and four. We'll take a short break from Road Atlanta. We'll have more historic racing after this. What if they sold tires online? We do, we're tirerag.com. They could offer lots of tires and help you find the right tire. It's called the Tire Decision Guide. Oh, and they could ship them to a nearby mechanic. We shipped over 7,000 independent recommended installers. This is an amazing idea. Sorry. Visit TireRack.com slash Pirelli to find the full line of Pirelli tires. Pirelli, power is nothing without control. TireRack.com, the way tire buying should be. I found a place in my heart. Range Rover Evoque.
Welcome back, and you join us here at Road Atlanta for the final weekend of SVRA and Trans Am. Trans Am have put on a great show, and we've had some great champions. Just to confirm, Mike Skeen wins our flagship TA2. Ernie Francis Jr. is a TA champion for the seventh time. Lee Saunders just wins the SGT class. And Kent Waits is our champion in XGT now. We turn our attention to what is a very interesting class as we look at Lewis Cooper Jr. in the nine boss class, Gross Point, Michigan, and he is in the Panos DP09 for what is our group five, seven, nine, and 11. Some interesting cars in this, especially this one, really like it. Pretty little thing in orange. David Yans at the wheel of the Arve Riley AR2. Former You know, interesting, I've got a good story here. This car was originally driven by Danny Sullivan and the in-house commentator David Miller here was telling me, uh, sorry, JJ O'Malley was telling me that uh, they put a call into Danny to let him know that uh, his car was out on, his former car was out on the track. Lovely story. So Danny Sullivan, in California, if you're tuning in, that car looks as good as it did when you drove it. Very, very nice indeed. And that's going to be interesting to watch. And... Interestingly enough, uh, we had James Farley here yesterday, and it says Dearborn, Michigan. Well, he is the CEO of Ford Motor Company, so that's the kind of guys we can attract to historic racing. And I believe uh, we even have an entry in SVRA from Mr. Elon Musk's car company here this weekend. So it really is an eclectic group of interesting Interesting cats, as they say, back in the 60s, uh, here for historic racing. Now, as you can imagine, with a 4.2-liter V10, Lewis Cooper kind of towers above. He's got some sticker tires on, as you can see, so it really isn't a fair race, but uh, that's not the point of historic racing. The point of historic racing is to stay clean, to enjoy your day out, and all, almost race against yourself because most of these guys have something like three days on track. They do a test day. Well, some of them do a test day on Thursday just to kind of shake the cars down. Uh, and then they go out and practice on Friday, qualify, and then have two feature races over the weekend. And really, it's a case of just sort of battling against yourself to see if you can better your time or adjust the car or learn a corner a little bit better. And a lot of the time, the enjoyment in historic racing is the tracks themselves, because these are the best tracks in America. That's something that Tony Perella and his team strive very hard to get right, is to make sure that they are at all the iconic tracks that historically have been home to these cars when they were raced for the first time, I suppose. John Fergus dominated this class with seven national championships. So being led round by the safety car, and he will peel off and let them go racing and roaring into action. Hopefully get Ben Sissel back up here because he has a real penchant for all of these cars, but he's dealing with Trans Am at the moment and they're effective prize giving for the finale. And in a moment, these beautiful cars will roar into action for your delicacy. Off comes the race, ca the uh, pace car. And our group five, seven, and nine, and group 11 are away. Off goes the Panos. And that it's a all bright orange car, number 70, with David Yans at the wheel, flying along in second place. And the Panos, obviously, with the slicks and wings. Getting plenty of grip through the S's. He can deal with that, no problem. I was talking to Boris Said, who was talking about taking a Formula One car around this track, and he said it was awesome. 
stuck to the track like glue. And that is James Farley, actually, the man I was mentioning before in that Lola T98. And interestingly enough, when he is with the Ford Motor Company, well, I can tell you it's got a Cosworth engine, so he's, he's making sure he's uh, doing it right. So Lewis Cooper Jr. leads the way in this 20-minute race. James Farley in second at the moment, David Yans in third, Gary Gould in fourth place, Brent Knoll fifth, and Dave Handy in the 59 as they stream down the back straight. And a glorious sight from the drone. Really does give you a sense of the speed that they're going. Here comes Danny Sullivan's car. Gary Gould at the wheel of what's called a Frisbee GP2. Gary's come all the way from Tulsa, Oklahoma to give it a run out this afternoon. First lap by Lewis Cooper Jr. a 124.9 and that's pretty impressive. Our Trans Am guys in the 21s and 22s so that panels is uh, not holding back by any means. Just a great sound. I love the historic sound of these uh, cars. I don't think there's anybody who went to a racetrack as a little boy and heard that scream and didn't think, ooh, what's happening here then? Let's, let's get amongst this. Now, yesterday, Gary finished, uh, what, fifth place behind David Yan, so he seemed to improve with the Frisbee. Looks like a massively wide car, but it's deceptive. Almost a single seater. And of course, Can Am cars were the, the big things of the late 70s. Hello. And I'll just pause for a second because obviously we've got a car, David Yans, off again. The yellow flag is out, but uh, I'm delighted to say that Dustin Hodges, who joined me yesterday, is back. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, of course. Just ran right over here from the TA podium. Good so. man. <laughs> What's happening out here? Uh, we we talk, I, I, Was it this group we talked about yesterday? It, there's been so many groups. Yes, it is. That's okay, why good. I decided to come back good, up. Good, good. There was one thing yesterday that I wanted to mention to you. As soon as I walked out the door, it popped into my head. Of okay. Course. The Panos out front. Yes. That's an Indy car. Oh. It's that is a, it's a genuine Indy car. 2007-ish champ car. Because, yeah, I was. Before the ah, unification. Right. So that was Sebastian Bourdais, Alex Tagliani. Gotcha. All those guys were racing that car about 15 years ago, I guess. Well, it's no wonder it's going. I was just, you know, I was, <laughs> as you came in, I was just mentioning that, uh, well, he's gone even faster. Lewis Cooper Jr. just did a 118.1. Uh, and when our Trans Am guys are doing 120s, 121s, he's, he's not holding back. <laughs> and now it's got all the bits and bobs that when it goes through the S's, it should stick to the floor like glue. But, a lot of uh, downforce. Yeah, a lot of downforce. <laughs> but uh, okay, so somebody like Bordet would have would have driven that car, yeah? Okay, that's, yeah, that's, uh, and it, it, it was in my head, like I said, right on the tip of my tongue. And of course, I remember when I leave, but... Well, let's talk about uh, the technology like involved in these cars. I mean, like I said, I've just been saying that this is an evolution, revolution of, of our history here and how the technology progressed. Um, and like you say, you've got cars here that, you know, go from late 60s all the way through to 2007. So you really have got a, a, a sort of a smorgasbord of, of, of the history of racing. What era, if you like, or what innovation appeals to you and, 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 and sort of says to you, wow, that, that's clever. Well, there's a lot of stuff over the years that was banned, but I think it's the stuff right. that I find Which the is most a shame. <laughs> you know, the, the six-wheel Terrell. Yeah, I remember um, that. The uh, the F-duct in F1 where they would cover their hand over a hole in the car to help it go fast. Like, there's all these crazy things that have happened over the years, but I think one of the biggest jumps that I find amazing is when they went from the two-frame cars, which to the carbon monocoque, yeah. which, like the, the two front running cars, that Panos and the F3 car, that just create a, a much safer cocoon for the driver to live in. Now, before we go any further, Dustin, let's just uh, talk about what you've been doing. You've been working with Silver Hair Racing. Congratulations. Uh, it's been not the best of weekends. You wanted to win the championship, but it's been a good weekend. 
you know, for the first year of this team, yes. we took home second in TA2, yep. second in Masters, and second in the Southern Cup. So That's I not bad. It's, you know, you got to look at the bright side of everything, and you can't win every day. And we took home three titles in 2020, and 2021 is only two months away. So. And what do you do with the team? I do all their marketing and media. I, uh, do, I make them look good. It's what <laughs> I like to tell people. So. Talking of looking uh, good. Ben Sissel's ben managed to, to come in. Yeah, you might, you might have to swap a seat. He, he's not in any rush. He's talked out. He never does anything but talk. Is well, that the guys is, is, I don't know if the tuxedo car is out there. Ben, ben Sissel's just walked in with no microphones. I don't know what he knows what he's talking about. But yeah, the, it's, the tuxedo car is out there. And is that why he has a tuxedo? Because he got married this he weekend? He got married here. Wow. Well, congratulations. Okay. Get, get, get your microphone on. Ben doesn't need a mic, so he doesn't use one. We live about like two me, miles really. from we're, each other. We're cheap, Ben. That's why. And, uh, so go actually, on, tell the story. Well, he actually Dan wrote me a sheet that okay, I brought up here. Okay, let's get you on. This All is right. Ben Sissel. The tuxedo car, Brent and Kylan Knoll were married on the start-finish line here at Road Atlanta on 4-1-2017. Oh, but we have a restart. Good. So we're going to come back to the tuxedo start. We look at Jim Farley holding off the Danny Sullivan Frisbee Can-Am car up into the hill. Well, I was told this morning that Danny Sullivan was actually informed that his car was out racing the, 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 the yesterday, and he was delighted. He said, oh, I've got great fond memories of that car. <laughs> Can-Am. Yes, yesterday I was, uh, as I mentioned, I, I referred to the Can-Am cars as older cars. Yeah. And I was lit up on social media. Apparently, <laughs> uh, apparently yeah, I'm you got to be careful stepping in here. You know, the thing is, my father is almost 80 years old, and he raced those in his 20s. There it so, is. There's the tuxedo with Dave Handy right behind him. <laughs> there you go. Brent Knoll. Right. Tell your story, Ben. And he's got a tuxedo racing suit. Well, he's wearing the tux because he got married here, but his car is also wearing a tux. He watched our live stream. He had a little bit of a uh, hit with somebody, and I said his tuxedo got torn, and he, sh he, sh he told me that was true. It did get torn a little bit, but he's repaired it. But, yeah, you're right. So Can-Am, you know, was a series in the 60s and 70s, the Monsters. But then it came back for the, like, two-liter Can-Am cars. Yes, yes. And it's had lots of iterations. It's definitely yeah, a barely fun. Everybody likes to, that, that branding. Yeah. But, see, I love the Internet trolls that kind of correct us or tell us what we're doing wrong. It just makes it more colorful. I love it. So keep trolling away, people. Leave us comments as nasty as you want on our Facebook and social media channels. <laughs> I was just mentioning a minute ago. I'm not that, here. I don't want trolls. <laughs> Were you aware that this is an actual Indy car? No. It's a Champ car. Champ, oh, 2007, 2008, before the reunification. Really? That is a Champ car. Uh, nice. that it's, uh, so, yeah, we have an actual Indy car out here going, what, seven seconds faster yeah, than the Yeah, he's cars? just, um, he's just laying he's just on the push to pass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no push to pass back then. It was a 118.5 he just did. So that's Dave Handy right there in the Sasco Orange. S2000, one of our fastest drivers in anything. I was really wishing for him in the Formula B race that we had at Circuit of the Americas with the Brabham's and Tonus. And then that's Brent Knoll. Look at that. That is pretty. Bond in that tuxedo. And he's actually two miles away from me in Nashville, and he told me that he has starred, and this is not an untruth. This is not a tall tale from Ben Sissel. This is not fake news. He, this is not fake news. He has starred in over 100 musicals, and Godspell was his favorite. He's been Jesus Christ several times. So we've got a musical tuxedo driver out there. Wow. You, you just don't know what's going on in those Tennessee woods back there, do you? You don't, no. But, so uh, I was just about to ask this, and I see in your notes that he also has a matching tuxedo driving suit. Yes, and he got married in it. That is Nothing impressive. Nothing says romance like getting married in a driver's suit. I love it. Can Brent, I just I say like that that's style. probably the perfect wife? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Or, or the most patient. That would probably be a better explanation. I hope she's a racing fan. There's another Tennessee in there, Gary Johnson, and it's almost Tennessee orangish red, S2000. Gary's a mechanic. For, he has a shop in Knoxville, Tennessee, for a lot of our drivers. So it's good to see him out here actually getting to be the driver. Pretty emotional, Trans Am. Uh, Chris Dyson, I heard a little, little, little well up as he was talking to you. A lot of emotion down there today, but it's the end of the year. It's been a very tough year for everybody. Uh, I was talking about John Claggett. It was nice to hear from him. You know, it's not a, not an easy year for anybody. It hasn't been, and they've done such a great job, John Claggett and Tony Perella. 
doing the best they can. I, uh, you know, I speak to Tony Perella quite a bit. He's done so much behind the scenes to just get us races. You know, after Sebring, we had such a great start at Sebring and Auto Club Speedway, and then it all just fell away. And Tony did not give up, and he worked so hard. We put together that E-Series championship with Trans Am, and uh, we were able to get some great races in. We, we still were able to hit some of the premier track. Dustin, what's happening with Silver Hair? Any plans for the future you can share with us? Uh, 2021 is only two months away, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. To, uh, I mean, literally, we've got Sebring and Homestead eight weeks from now. So, uh, no, I, I think they're uh, same plan as this year. They've got Rafa Matos lined up, Maurice Hall. Like I said, they just took home second in both in all in three championships. And they're geared up to go for all three titles next year. I think that's the plan. And. I think that's what they're rolling for. Now, listen, I don't know how you, you know, how you, you know, look for your drivers, but um, both Ben and I, we do our sporting the silver hair. Do we? We have a third car in the hauler. You guys should have said something yesterday. Well, okay. I mean that. I mean that does get a, a really you, fast Ford Mustang just sitting in there waiting Ooh. for a driver. Oh, oh I mean, man, a Ford Mustang. You no, know, it's. Uh, what year is it? Uh, you don't 2020. Know. Oh my <laughs> word! No, that's way too fast for me. Well, now speaking of Ford Mustang. Uh -oh. There goes Danny Sullivan in, but that's not a Ford Mustang. But Jim Farley is out there, the CEO of the Ford know, Motor Company, yeah, I know. is out there racing a Lola right now. And Ford has been on the podium quite a bit this weekend in SVRA and Trans Am. Yes, they have. He needs to come to more races, though. Yeah. They keep picking it up. That's He's the good luck charm, We had apparently. a Ford on top in TA and a Ford on top in TA2 and a Ford on top in GT. Wow. That's a good point. Yep. And that's an Indy car. That is a Panos Champ car. Champ car. car. Yes, those are actually, that's one of the fastest Indy cars we've ever made. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny how sometimes they've now restricted cars that they're not running the same lap times they did 20, 10, 20 years ago? Yeah, they yeah. seem to get faster even though they're technically slower. But if you've ever been <laughs> to the Indy 500 during qualifying week, uh, you can understand why eventually Ari Larendike's, uh, you know, lap record might have been beaten, but my word, it was getting to the point where these cars were just flying that's uh rafa matos told me that they actually run negative rear wing in qualifying wow so just to keep them down think about that for a minute. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah 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 just just think about Nothing that for light. a second that is a pretty car though it's definitely a pretty car it was great we had uh you'll you'll enjoy this dustin we had a rather shy on board with one of the drivers in um, TA. Can you imagine who it would be that we talked to on the warm-up lap? Um, he was very res resistant to talk. Tommy Dreesey. Okay. I was, I was trying <laughs> to figure out if this Hollywood. was a sarcastic no, question no, or I'm not here. I'm thinking, no, we had an English it. accent. It, off, too. Yes. It, was a, it was an amazing feat, and he's like, well, hi, everybody. And I, uh, <laughs> It was great. I really I, like the lines of this Lewis Cooper Jr. racing that champ car. He is, it looks like it's just stuck to the ground like a slot car. Is that all the downforce in these cars, Dustin? Oh, yes. They, an, an IndyCar weighs somewhere, depending on the years, you know, roughly a little under 2,000 pounds. But when they get on the, those big ovals, the amount of downforce that pushes on them, they can weigh three to four times that. The, the amount of downforce, there's this old saying that they could run upside down in a tunnel if they were going fast enough. Now, these are two really good friends here, Steve Conson and Gary Johnson racing together now they've raced together in all kinds of mgs um, but now here they are in s2000s also pretty equally yoked steve conson has probably one of my favorite prettiest mgs that i've ever seen is mg t series he raced it with us at watkins Glen. it's unbelievable but he's hey, had tell some me more about the s2000 s2000 really this class here the vid was started as a racer's race class they're pretty spec there's d different manufacturers, but then the beauty of it is it's a, um, a Hewland like VW transmission that you can get from lots of cars. They were widely available Looks with like a, a Ford Pinto into the radical. and a Ford Pinto two liter engine well, that were all over junkyards at the time. And they're really easy to come by, but they have a lot of torque and they're really easy to work on and make reliable. And uh, so that's what it is. It's so a it's driver's affordable class. racing then at that point. It was affordable racing, but because this is such a fun class, these cars are available 
but they're, um, you know, it depends on who you are if they're affordable because it's so much fun. There's a demand for these cars still. Right. And uh, so they, they range probably thirty to $50,000 for a good turnkey. That would be probably more than that because that's a top-notch, well-prepared. Dave Sasko is an unbelievable mechanic. He's got a great shop just outside of VIR, but that's a very fast car with one of our most talented drivers of the weekend out here. And i got to brag on his wife, Robin. As a vintage racing journalist myself, if I can call myself that, she is the best. She takes the best photos, best stories. And then there's Jim Farley. Look at how pretty this car is. And so is this his first weekend with us? No, he's been with us a long time. He, okay. he loves racing. And um, this is his vacation. He was on the podium. He won the Enduro overall. He won his class. And, uh, you know, he loves being able to get away. And this is so you know that he's a true motorsports automotive fan when he's worked probably a really long week, can't imagine the stress that he's under, and this is how he gets away from it all. He's That's racing a Lamar Cobra, a, a lunch, 1966 <laughs> Cobra, I believe, in the Lamar finish, and now he's out here in Alola, and that's, there's a lot of G-forces in that car, so my hat's off to him, and he's having it. 15-year-old. He's having so much fun out here racing. Well, I can tell you, the, these S2000 cars are definitely a great place to go racing, and if anybody wants to get involved, they are fun. I can personally attest to this. I drove one of these at Mid-Ohio years ago when they had a semi-pro series going on, and it is a lot of fun. Oh, we got an off. Uh-oh. I think that's Brent. Yeah. Tuxedo getting dirty. Tuxedo's going to have to go to the dry cleaners, Brent. Brent Knoll off. Oh, dear. Well, he's okay. Yeah, he's okay. That's a beautiful car. Now, that's the oldest car in the field. He wanted to point that out. And uh, he is going to give us in-car after the weekend. He promised me that, so we'll be oh, able so to know what play. happened. We'll, we'll have to edit that in if you follow us on social You're media. you have to hold him to that one. We'll yeah, have that say, up in yeah, a few you weeks. You might not get that now. <laughs> well, here's Lewis Cooper Jr. again, and let's have a look. He, oh, look, he's got it down at 113.8. Wow. He's just up in the face. He's, he's not letting go. I love it. I was saying earlier, boys, uh, it's not really a race against each other. It's a, great, a race against yourself. You, you want to see what, what lap times you can do and how, how you can learn these iconic circuits. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Looks like he's uh, stuck there. Doesn't be able to get that refired. I guess we're uh, yeah, gonna we're going to hold off a little bit uh, again, huh? He's not trying too hard to get it restarted. I think he's uh, stuck there. Yeah. That's unfortunate. It's really fun to watch. The more cars on track, the better, and uh, he might be in a place that they're going to show showing a local yellow right now. I see and, uh, uh, the pace might. cars rolling out of pit lane right now. Yeah, well, no, he's, yes, he is. Yep, so that's Lewis right. Cooper Jr. Right and by the there. way, he has done 12 laps to Farley's six. <laughs> so that's how much quicker he's going. He, he's getting his money's worth. Yes, <laughs> sure. So out comes the pace car. But again, in these open class races, you know, I have a, a 27 Model T and 35 miles an hour in that just well, that feels like, you know, it's super scary. Yeah, you keep as that to compared yourself. to like a 150 <laughs> miles an hour in a new Corvette. Yeah. You know, it probably feels about the same level of adrenaline. So even though Lewis Cooper Jr. is pulling the laps, uh, Jim Farley might have a little bit more of his hands full, and that older Lola doesn't have all the um, great controls and, and as much downforce. But look at those two cars together. Shot. It's one of the things that I noticed over the years when you take people that haven't don't have a lot of on-track experience, and you know they drive to the track, they're going down the highway at 90 miles an hour or whatever. Yeah. But then they get here, and their first few laps, it's it's very timid and intimidating. Yeah, it, imagine. You, it's a completely different comfort zone. The sensation of speed is different, which I think a lot of people don't fully understand. Well, and, and when people say why, and the, the reason is it's it's how close you are to the ground. Yeah. Uh, a go kart could be doing 30 miles an hour, but it feels like 80. That's right. So we're looking at our Group 9 first place there in that Indy car of Lewis Cooper Jr. And our Group 7 first place in Jim Farley. Our Group 5 first place is Dave Handy in that Sasco orange and white S2000. So our three class leaders are 1, 2, 3 overall in this. So we're under safety here in our what? 
Group 5, 7, 9, and 11 class. And uh, I think time just ran out on Yeah, them. I think it pretty much has done, but never mind. They've had a good run. What are you looking forward to, Ben? I know you're always looking for one. I, we, you well, I was on the your Trans one, two, three, podium four for my favorite group. We had some fun. We had some fun. Um, you know, I always say I love all cars. It really doesn't matter. I just, I, I love <laughs> you know, it. you know, but um, you, you could probably. So I missed out on all my small bore British cars. But, uh, you know, it's fine. I still love all this they racing. They might give you a peer ship for that kind of comment because nobody, nobody talks that that. Yeah, no, they're glowingly getting, they're, about British. I mean, they're getting ready cars. to knight Lewis Hamilton. If, yeah, if honors, I, you, you might want to get in line, Ben. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> you can stand next to him and talk cars. <laughs> I'm not sure he's an MG fan. <laughs> I don't know. His brother's in touring cars. Somebody was telling me that uh, Lewis has driven a radical before now. So there you go. Wow. So uh, Jim Farley will win Group Seven. Lewis Cooper Jr. will win Group 9, and Dave Handy will win Group 5. And there is the check and flag. There's Dave Handy in his Group 5 Sasco S2000. Beautiful car. He is a great driver. Coming up a little later, we'll get a chance to see Boris Said Jr., the 16-year-old, cutting his teeth in the Miata Heritage Cup. He's not the only one out there, but uh, he's been our feature this weekend for sure. Across the line now is the Shannon number two. How many father-son combinations are in these weekends? It seems like it happens a lot. Well, Quite a bit. I just interviewed the Morrows in that beautiful, they're going to be, actually, I see them on grid right now. They're in that Penske livery, or as the Americans say, paint scheme, <laughs> uh, Marlboro <laughs> Alfa Romeo, and uh, it's a father-son. Let me just give you a confirmation of the result then. Lewis Cooper Jr. wins in the, 90, in the 9 Boss uh, class. In the 72 class, James Farley in the Lola 298 wins. Dave Handy uh, is third overall. Steve Conson, then Gary Johnson, Brent Knoll, Gary Gould, and David Yans was the man in that Arve Riley RAR2 that went off uh, and caused one of the uh, safety car incidents and uh, a few cars coming back to the pits but that concludes our group five seven nine and eleven my thanks to dustin hodges uh joining us and sprinting over from the pit lane and picking up where he left off yesterday thanks for joining guys, us. guys thanks for having me and uh you know i'll see you in a few months in sebring absolutely gosh all it right is. dustin thanks thank a lot, you guys all right we'll take a short break we'll be right back from road atlanta in a moment when the finish line calls we answer. Hit the road with insurance protection from Haggerty. Whether you drive a built racer, sports car, or exotic, and save an average of $264. Get a quote today at Haggerty.com. Back to Road Atlanta. Now, as you can see, it's clouded up a bit. But still a beautiful day here. And talking of beauty, look at that. An Alfa Romeo ready to roar into action for our next group coverage, which will be Group 8, 6, and 12. That's some cracking cars in there. That's Rick Ortman giving us the thumbs up. Last year's Group 12 champion. Really fast car. There's the beautiful Shelby GT350 that my buddy Dennis Altoff takes care of. I'm looking through all of our sheets. Do we have grid sheets? Yeah, I'll come up with them. One second, sir. This is a, that's Gary Moore, 
one of my favorite cars, that Mercury Cougar. Vinyl top. Tony, if you can get a shot of that vinyl top, good stuff. John McCormick, another Nashvillian. Must be something happening in the Music City. That's John McCormick in that beautiful Cobra Automotive Ford Cobra number 28. We saw Jim Farley uh, come in early in that Lola. So, Tony, if, oh, look at that good arty shot right there. Like watching that movie Grand Prix. The next blue Cobra that you see, that was Jim Farley in that last race in that Alpha. Look at that. In that Lamar style, 1966 Alpha Romeo. So this is our group six, eight, and 12 race. Now, as we said earlier, they've um, had a We don't have our yesterday. today's grid sheets, though. This is yesterday's grid sheets. That's right, yeah. We need today's grid sheets, people. <laughs> Get to it. So that's Scott Borchetta there, right there in first place in uh, on pole position. We're going to wait to get our grid sheets until we can, or until they cross the uh, start-finish line. So if anybody's listening to this broadcast, can somebody please bring us our grid sheets? But what a beautiful, the Johnny Lightning, Lightning Bolts. Jerry Robinson right there in the Green Viper. There's Gary Moore, John McCormick, followed by Jim Farley. Lots of Fords out here, Mercury's, that's in the Ford family, and then the Lexus. That beautiful Lexus. The driver of that car actually owns a Toyota dealership and I believe Fort Smith, Arkansas. Yeah, it's a really uh, interesting group here because uh, you've got some open wheel cars, you've got Sintops, and you've got that uh, Alfa Romeo, the, the lone Alfa Romeo in the Marlboro colors. Well, there's two Alfa Romeos, that's the BMW. Look at that. So the field working their way through 67, uh, and some of the fields are already approaching 39. So they are forming up nicely. And tidily led by Scott Borchetta in that uh, fantastic Corvette. And he was putting it through its paces yesterday. And I'm sure he'll do the same again today. One of the larger groups so far. This is Group 6, Group 8 and Group 12 about to get underway. The pace car comes off. Beautiful roar of the muscle cars as they head out. Just a dab on the brakes going into turn one. Corvettes, Vipers. with us. Mark Brummond in that Alfa Romeo. This is usually the fan favorites. If you're joining us on our social medias or the SVRA app, Leave us some questions or comments on social media. I'm, I'm monitoring our Facebook right now, so if you want to leave some questions or comments on our Facebook, we'll be answering them. Tell us where you're watching from and what you'd like to see more of, and we will try our best to provide that to you. Yeah, and as Dustin quite rightly reminded us, we're only a couple of months away from uh, doing it all again back at Sebring. And I'm, I know I'm excited about the 2021 schedule, 14 events uh pretty big schedule uh a lot of work but it's gonna be a lot of fun i think yeah that's trans am we have 18 yeah. oh, oh God, 18 yes. races as we look at this battle here between group 12 jerry came on top two weeks ago with these two cars in group 12 at circuit of the americas but right now jeff lindstrom has jerry a little bit you'll notice the duct tape he had an off yesterday 
that his crew, Dylan Archer and Bobby Archer and Jerry, worked hard to fix. It's good to have them out here. Jerry is actually his uh, Dodge Viper Club president out of Houston, Texas. And then that's Mark Hildebrandt racing that Duntoff Corvette, trying best to keep up with him. He's group six. Scott Borchetta is in our A production, group six Corvette. He just took off. But the car in this group that I really love is the group eight of the Mora. We were talking about them last race, the father, son, son. I never know who's in the car, but it's a really cool car, really cool story. I interviewed them today. We're going to put that up. So right now, race monitor is saying it's Glenn Morrow in the car. And that's Jim Farley racing Hugh Booker, Mustang versus Cobra. There is a good shot. Looks like he's getting a little bit of smoke from Mark Ooh. Brumman. That's oil smoke. So I uh, hope that the flaggers are putting out the SVRA. Yeah, you it's are too much oil to uh, be safe, isn't because it? Because Rick Ortman is right behind him. I hope he stays safe in that Corvette. You know, one thing that I've now come to realize is how important the mechanics stroke engineers of these cars are. I know a lot of people do themselves, the owners, but you've got to have a nice, you've got to have a guy that knows the technology of the era be able to get it right yeah 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 and sadly some of these guys that like that are su or weber carburetor tuners you know sadly we're losing them and the yeah. skill of that to actually fix and repair a car our generation is more of the replace the whole part <laughs> than actually tune the whole part and fix it so it's becoming scarce and keeping the like this beautiful 1966 cobra right here of jim farley look at the line the short uh, oh. what we'd call trunk lid to keep the aerodynamics of that Le Mans style uh, Cobra going, but to keep those cars running, it's a 1966 being pushed to its limits is really tough to do. And so I applaud Cobra Automotive and Jim Farley for keeping these cars running. They're beautiful. A lot of work and effort goes into keeping these cars tuned up and race ready. And I honestly uh, don't think, give it up to R&M and Cobra Automotive, I don't think Jim Farley has missed a lap all weekend. Currently in seventh position in our group races here. You're watching SVRA and the final event of the year. Hugh I still Booker. can't quite work out. You told me this yesterday, but explain how the Lexus gets in here. Well, the Lexus is um, a purpose-built race car. It raced in one of the race series. I'm not quite sure which. But um, basically, as Rick Parent, our chief of tech, says, if it's... Mark Brumman is in, so he yeah. did see the smoke. So the thank Alfa you Romeo to, has retired. Yep. Thanks to Road Atlanta for displaying the UR oiling, meatball flags that SVRA has made. But the uh, the Lexus is a purpose-built race car, and it's more than seven years old, so it's out here racing with us. And we welcome, if you're watching and you're like, I've got one of those in my barn or garage, come out here and join Ron Pauly racing a Lexus, owns a Toyota dealership in, I think, Fort Smith, Arkansas. So he's doing a little R&D out here with us. <laughs> yeah. been a great weekend of racing and a full field in each and every class and of course a massive field of over 40 plus cars in Trans Am and that was a great race we just witnessed with all five classes involved to end our season and that Lexus currently in what ninth position overall with Ron Pauley Yep, ninth position. He's racing in Group 12. So Group 12 is basically cars that are prepared uh, after 1973 or newer. Group 6 is 72 or older, but big bore. And there's Group 12A and 12B. 12A is the higher displacement, higher horsepower cars. But I'm hoping that the camera guys can give us a shot of that Penske liveried Alfa Romeo that yeah, the yeah. Moros drove. They went to our race school, father, son, son, at Roebling Road, and now it's almost odd to not see them at the racetrack. A really pretty car, and they are some of the most enthusiastic people out here racing with us. You know, I think that's the first Alfa Romeo I've ever seen in all gray. It's yeah. either red, yellow, whatever, but it's, I, you know, never seen an all gray Alfa Romeo. And it's beautiful. It's, it's Helmet National Championship winner from 2020 this year. Mayor Primo. 
I hope I'm saying his name right, and that's Rick Ortman, last year's Group 12 winner. And he also went through our Roebling Road Driver School to relicense. He was a Trans Am driver in the early 70s, and he decided to come back to racing, so kind of got his little brush up testing with us at Roebling Road, and he's been back out at nearly all the races the last two years. So we welcome Rick Ortman. Love having him out here in that beautiful Group 12 Chevrolet Corvette, number 26. But I'm hoping our camera guys are listening. I really want a shot of that Alfa Romeo because, man, does it show up on camera. It's showing that Mike Levine is out there. So Mike Levine was in a Group 3 Corvair. So if we get a shot of that white Corvair, it had drum brakes making it a Group 3. The drum brakes weren't working, so he went home 30 minutes away and put on his disc brakes, moving him to Group 8. And huh. hopefully he's out there running. That beautiful. Oh, that's right. oh he's coming right by us. So he's on camera one position right behind Scott Borchetta. If the camera guys are listening, that's Scott Borchetta in the 05. And then there goes that Alpha into turn one. Yeah. Scott Obviously Borchetta leading it. Group six. Here we go. And your wishes are command. Let's see, that's the Jerry Robinson, coming second through. overall, leading in Group 12. He got around Jeff Lindstrom. There he is. And there's that Corvair ducking down, but there's Glenn Morrow right there. Beautiful car, father, son, son. Chase and Logan, I'm sure, aside, cheering him on. Jeff Lindstrom must have had an off because now he's trying to catch up as he's passing our Group 8 winner from 2020, Scott Berkland. And then there's Mark Hildebrandt in that Guntoff. Corvette, Mark from Texas. Yeah, talk a little six. bit about Duntoff because that, that that's a story that goes right through both SBRA and Trans Am all the way to... Uh... Yeah, so Edward Savagian and Alan Savagian run Duntoff Motors out of Texas, named after Duntoff, the designer of uh, Corvettes, the famous Corvettes. And they've been... Uh, Alan was a Trans Am racer back in the Willie T days. And then he started vintage racing, and they said, well, let's just make the fastest Corvette. So they started that, and they have a lot of customers. They also make street Corvettes and resto mods out of Dallas, Texas. And then Edward Savage and his son has taken over the business and wanted to start Trans Am racing again. So now he's racing in TA2, but still uh, looking after these vintage cars. Edward is probably in my top three of the fastest vintage drivers that we have. And so I knew he'd be at the top in TA2 pretty quickly. And... In one of his first tries, he's on the podium at Circuit of the Americas last yep, year. That's right. I remember. So Lee Simpkins is saying he's watching from about 50 miles away. Well, Lee, I hope you like the broadcast, but you're really missing out on not driving that 50 miles this morning to come out here and join us. The drone shots are great, but there's nothing like feeling and experiencing these cars in person. So we will be back here with the Atlanta Speed Tour in March, speedtour.net for tickets. Tell all your friends. Jamie Lasseur is telling us that Cobra Automotive is building his engine. So, Jamie, we hope to see you out here. They build some super fast and reliable. There it is, Mike Levine. There's my two favorite cars right there. Mike Levine in a beautiful, what I would call Series 1 Corvair. Look at that. Racing that Alfa Romeo of Glenn Morrow. So, do you know? I mean, when you say Corvette, they were a separate company. It's not. It's nothing to do with Corvette, right? <laughs> no, no. It's just a Corvair rear engine, I believe, air cooled. That's the air part of Corvair. And uh, there he is, Gary Moore, who knows Mike really well, because Mike also races a Corvair that's got a mid-engine Corvette-mounted car right. that he races in another group and another series. But this is his real, true, probably gold medallion Corvair. Beautiful car. He's a really good race car driver. Lives about, he said, about 30, 40 minutes away from here. But those are my two favorite cars in this group. Group 8, Corvair, and an Alfa Romeo of Glenn Mara. Coming out, guys. Mike Levine, we really appreciate the hustle. Going all the way home, putting on disc brakes and coming back, putting on a show for your home crowd here. Look at that car. It and is. I tell you what, the Corvair group is one of the, my favorite groups. They usually bring out, when we do a Corvair feature race, they'll bring out like 18 or 20 Corvairs. And if you know Corvairs, it's really hard to get a Corvair running reliably. The rear belt, you know, the rear engine, the belt comes up, does a 90-degree turn, 
And uh, so it's so much fun to watch those things. They've got so much body rolls. We so watch, when was look the heyday? Jim Farley coming by. Beautiful Cobra passing that. I, I don't know if they had a heyday because it seems like as soon as they got released, Ralph Nader wrote that book, Unsafe <laughs> at Any Speed, uh, kind of denouncing the Corvairs. But yeah. I, I, fi I find that he was wrong a little bit. I love the look. And uh, they made some improvements to make them safer. But I think because of that book and the notoriety, they just couldn't hang on. Scott Berkland in that uh, Porsche 911. Very cute. Very cute. He just did a, a 155.6. Now, Scott Berkland is at almost every race that we do. In fact, it's so odd not to see him in a race. He races with Dave Handy. I'll come up to Dave and Robin Handy and say, hey, why isn't Scott here? And uh, great racer. He was an IMSA racer back in the day. He's one of our instructors. And uh, he's out there. But joining us soon in the booth is going to be Jesse Pinnell. She's one of our registrars. Her husband, Joey Pinnell, is back home in California taking care of the kids. But she's going to come up here and put on these headphones. I'm putting her on the spot. She's doing everything she's she running. can. She's running. I've Not, never oh, seen anybody. Leaving? Oh, Jesse, you got to come in and tell us how it, it went. She, we've run her ragged selling tickets to speed to her. And I've got some, some ticket tickets and how we can get tickets. She is our guru of ticket sales, our registrar. So, Jesse, you joined us on the West Coast. you got to put these on. Oh, you got to talk loud. She hates me so much right now. She yeah, just I know. now, but she's, now she's going to pretend like she likes lovely, me. She's lovely, though. She's going to talk to us. Yesterday, I saw Joey had logged on and was making some, some uh, comments. So you joined us with SVRA as the registrar. And I met you, I think, at Sonoma. And now you're a registrar and you were selling tickets. Yesterday, you were slammed with tickets. Tell us about your weekend. Well, at about 9 o'clock in the morning, we were cars deep to the end of the rows. Uh, it was crazy. And there was three of us. <laughs> but you managed, right? We did manage. And we and how did the car show go? Uh, as far as I know, it was good. That's Tony Strollo's job. Um, but you saw all the cars come through. They had tons of cars yeah. coming through. It was fun. As we watch Ron Fuller. So, Jesse, I'm going to put you on the spot even more. You got to pick a favorite car from this group. I love this car of Ron Fuller. I love when they come out here. That's a Group Eight car, I believe. Really fun to watch these guys racing these cars around. Ron Fuller in the 1977 Datsun 200 SX. I'm that, giving Jesse the list that we have right now. Is she picking one? Yeah, but you got to pick a favorite car. So, Jesse. You're a mother of two young children. You get to come out here, and you would think that it'd be a little bit of a break, but you probably get more tired on these weekends than you would with two young children at home. I'm going to have to agree. I am so exhausted by the time I get home. I probably won't do anything for 48 hours <laughs> other than take care of the kids. Yeah, and her husband, a Joey. A warm bath and, <laughs> yeah. and silence. Her yeah. husband, Joey, comes out to the events and uh, usually takes care of the kids. And I work pretty hard in an event, but when he brings the kids, I'd say he works harder than I do. He helps me put up my signs and banners, but then he's also keeping care of the kids. Yeah, he's a really great dad. So your first time to road Atlanta, what's your first impression? Oh my gosh, it's beautiful here. Georgia is really gorgeous. Yeah, uh -oh. I love it. Do I, I hear the tone of a potential Californian Looking transplant. around transplant. at Georgia, <laughs> yeah. like potential it. transplant here. You may, you may not, you may have already known that. <laughs> maybe, maybe a little birdie told me. As we watch John McCormick. There's That's a, a pretty car. car. <laughs> not only that, he's a veterinarian in real life. Oh. So if you like animals, you got to be cheering for John McCormick out of Nashville, Tennessee, racing with Cobra Automotive. And uh, John and his wife are all about vintage racing. She loves watching it. I was up at Turn Twelve or turn 10A today during the Enduro, and she's up there as a spotter. I was setting up a camera, and she's up there spotting, telling them where the cars are. So she loves it just as much as he does, and we love seeing that. So John, Jonathan, you got to pick a favorite car in this group too. Well, I, I think I'm with Jesse on this. I think Joe McCormick in that uh, Ford Cobra. Oh, she hasn't picked. I picked oh. for her. She's going to speak for herself. All right. 
Well, I've got with the Ford Coma. And if you're at home watching, let's hear about your favorite car. Leave us in the comments on Facebook. I'm watching Facebook right now. I just think that's, I love it. that looks fun to drive. He looks like he's having fun. It looks as though it's got plenty of grip. It's sticking nicely to because that, that first corner is tough. You know what? We're getting yelled at by Jim Harris on here. I love it, Jim. We're going to announce the cars that we're seeing on camera now. So that is okay. Gary Moore right there in that beautiful Mercury Cougar with the vinyl top. Gary also races a Shelby GT350 with us, a Lola GT40. But there's that Mercury Cougar. I am loving this car. Always one of our fastest drivers in Group 6 as he's passing this beautiful Ford Falcon. Who's racing the Falcon, Jesse? That's Bradley Steele. What year is that Falcon? It is a 64. Oh, and Jesse has just now taken another job. SVRA <laughs> is going to come into the booth and commentate with us. I love it. Good stuff. You're more than welcome. So see, Jim Harris leaves a comment that he'd like for us to follow the cars on camera. And we're going to follow his directions as we come down here. The back straight looks like McCormick may be coming up and passing. That's Mark Hildebrandt right there with his GoPro on top of that car. And who is in this beautiful Shelby GT350, the number 74, Stephen Coleman. 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 <laughs> with Dennis Altoff, his mechanic, probably on the side of the track, telling him what cars are coming up as we see Mayor Primo in that Alfa Romeo. But Mark Hildebrandt leads the train down what we would call the historic S's at Road Atlanta. I like the look of that car. Have you picked a favorite yet, Jesse? I'm trying. It's hard to pick one. It is. It is. But I, I'm not a very political person. And, hey, I'm picking two cars that aren't British, Jonathan. That's, uh, uh, yeah. You would think I'd pick the Cobra since they have some British lineage. But for me, it's that uh, Corvair and the Alpha. But, this, you know, these Shelby. All right, GT Jesse, I got one for you. See, good. how about this? You're looking at the, the 74, but behind it is, a, is an all-gray Alfa Romeo. There it is. Mayor Primo's. Oh, see that, Jesse? Oh, yeah. That's a dove gray Alfa Romeo going through turn seven there. I was going to pick an Alfa Romeo. There you go. Well, you've got two to pick from. Yep. The one Mark Brummins went out, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Can't have that. But he did win in our SGT class. And here we are, final lap. Scott Borchetta, big machine vodka, big machine records, big machine hand sanitizer with the Johnny Lightning. And the Johnny Lightning man. Come on, you want to hear some good stuff? Go on. Jonathan. Give us your last lap race analysis. Give us some hype here as we watch Scott Borchetta come across the start finish line to win again in group six. Well, back from the Unza family. He's been sporting the lightning stripe of the Unza family. The Johnny Lightning, Bobby Unza. Stripe since he was a little boy. Scott Borchetta heading down to what has been a magnificent weekend for him. Both in SVRA, he's a Group 6 champion, has been for many a year, now turned TA2 driver. And here he comes, down to turn 10, on the brakes, down through the gearbox, into second gear through 10A. Just a little dab, switches sides to go up the hill, change of gear as he comes under the bridge for the final time. Scott Borchetta will come and take the checkered flag here on the final lap of our group racing to end his weekend with a win. And well done to Scott Borchetta of Nashville, Tennessee. And if you want to go to the Nashville Grand Prix, ask Music him City Grand Prix, yeah, one of the owners of Music City. We have two of the owners of Music City Grand Prix coming in August that TA2 will be racing at. Jesse, if you tell us which one's your favorite, we'll let you off the hot seat, but we hope that you join us in the commentator's booth again in 2021. I'm going to go with Mayor Primo's. Alpha Romeo. Nice. Good pick. All right, Jesse Pinnell, you're off the hot seat. Thank you for your hard work this weekend. We we'll did see great see in, in the sales. commentary booth. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Well, we'll just bring the commentary over to the ticket box then. Jesse Thanks for coming just in. punched me very hard in the oh, shoulder. Ouch. And she is an avid weightlifter with CrossFit, so she's probably the only person on our staff that could beat me up. Yep. Scott Borchetta now. She's, she's, I can't tell if she's Jerry crying or Robinson laughing. Robinson taking second place. But Joey Pinnell, thank you so much for lending us, Jesse, to help out this weekend. Sorry, Jonathan, I'm doing a horrible job. I'm going to give it back to you. No, I'm just going through who we've got. Thanks, Jesse. Jerry Robinson taking second place. Mark Hildebrand in third. Jeff Lindstrom in fourth. 
And then comes that uh, beautiful Porsche coming through shot there. John McCormick, he's raced the V-Rock with us quite a few times. Uh, he's been partners with uh, Lynn St. James, uh, one of our avid racers in Group 6 with Kurt Boat's group, the Cobra Automotive. Uh, there are some beautiful cars in this class, Jonathan, but take us away. Yep, Scott Borchetta, as you heard there, the Chevrolet Corvette winning in Handley, obviously. Jerry Robinson second, Mark Hildebrand in the Chevrolet Corvette taking third, Jeff Lindstrom in the Ford Mustang Coupe in fourth place, Gary Moore in fifth in the Mercury Cougar, and then it was the Ford Cobra, my favourite car out there, John McCormick taking sixth place, James Farley seventh uh, in the Ford Cobra, and then eighth was uh, Hugh Booker, and ninth Ron Pauly in that Lexus, the unique Lexus in a field of quite different cars and Rick Ortman in 10th position. So that's how they rounded out our Group 6, Group 8, and Group 12 race two. We'll take a short break from here in Road Atlanta. Join us in a moment. More historic and vintage car racing coming. I'm Willie T. Ritz. Meet my friend Brian Cook, a wealth advisor, who's one of us, a winner. Both racing and finance are unpredictable. You want a pro team guiding you. Ryan and his team work hard to keep you winning in life, not just financially. Get to your goal faster and enjoy the drive more. Schedule a free conversation with Brian at Cook Wealth Management, SVRA's official wealth management company. And join Brian and me in the winner circle. I travel a lot. Whether it's a meeting in New York or a car auction in LA, I trust only Passport Transport to deliver my car. With their up-to-the-minute GPS tracking system, I know exactly where my car is at all times. They take the extra step to secure my vehicle's safety, and their pickup and delivery service is truly door-to-door. -door. With Passport Transport, I know my car's in good hands, because they're car guys too. I'm Roger Van Ness, CEO of Kemp Auto Museum, and this is why I'm a Passport Transport customer. Welcome back to Road Atlanta, and we've got something special coming up, because look what we've got coming now. We've got the Miatas, and I'm looking forward to this one. We had a lot of fun with this one yesterday, and it's quite an interesting uh, group of drivers, young and old, or young and experienced, I should say. Um, but uh, they put on a good show yesterday, and I think they're about to do the same again. Good track for Miata Racing, I think. It really is. I don't know if there's a bad track for Miata Racing. Um, you know, I, I did miss my one, three, four. This is quickly becoming another favorite group of mine though and and i think because i love the british sports cars so much the to me these are british sports cars made by the japanese to be a little bit i'd say a lot a bit more reliable than british sports cars so we had a great race it was a great race all the way up to fourth to cash i think he finished fourth yesterday in our spec miata race and uh i expect for some good racing in this group boris said the fourth is going to be out there in his advanced auto as we look at Blevins. So here we are at the grid, and I'm trying to get my sheets in order so we can call this race. That's Skyler. That's Cottrell, who is from here. Remember, his, uh, his family Cottrell. person member was was uh, texting us yesterday or leaving comments. Wasn't telling his us, mom? She's yeah. 17, right? Three generations of racing right there. He's 17 from the area. That's Bill Miller. And that was uh, Boris said Jr. One of a kind, leather items, wallets, totes, portfolios, pledges, purses. He had a great gift idea. Wolf leather on Bender Road. I don't have a grid sheet for the Spec Miata race, do you? All right. We're running on empty here again at Michelin Raceway Road, Atlanta. We don't have grid sheets, but uh, we'll, yeah. See, Jesse Pinnell still in here. And she's going to go run and get us grid sheets like she has, like she needs something else to do. But it was cool to see Becky Pengraff is watching us. She left a comment, Jesse, that she loves you. I think up in timing of scoring. Becky is one of our chiefs of grid on the West Coast. And her husband, Bob, vintage racing photographers. So thanks for joining us, guys. We hope to see you next year when we come back to the West Coast. So, Jonathan, this Miata class, this got us in a lot of trouble politically with vintage racers. Vintage racers, for a while, when Tony Perella first introduced this, 
were upset by the Miatas because they had heard all the rumors about the the banging around and the well, bump drafting. Yeah, and around the world, Miata. Miatas do bang but and bang and bump. If don't you've they? ever been to a Tony Perella drivers meeting, he he can be a sheriff and lay down the law. And um, you know, we explained to the Miata drivers that this is vintage racing; it's no contact sport. And at first, they were all kind of reluctant to join in on that. Right. But then, the more and more they race with us. I've heard, I keep hearing from, from these drivers that they love this style of racing, that they can paint their car once and not have to worry about painting it after each weekend. We ask them to prepare their cars to look like vintage race cars, meaning the panels match. There's no duct tape holding things on. And uh, they love it. So they know that coming in like here, last lap into 10A, that you're not going to get punted by somebody behind you. And uh, it's really, really tough racing because a lot of the – skilled spec Miata drivers would kind of use the other drivers to bump them through the turns, you know, and try to keep up. But here it is wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, but no contact, which means you've got to be a lot better driver to be up front in this mixed group of NA, NB, Miata, Miata, Mazda Heritage Group with SVRA. So if you have one of these Miatas in your barn or garage, Get it off the mothballs, get that thing fixed up, and come out here and race with us because this group is growing. I think we had 35 with us at Road America as I'm going to send the call over to you, Jonathan. Here we go then. Now watch for a couple of things. There's a lot of strategy involved in Miata Racing. We'll get to that in a moment as they come under the bridge. Two by two. Nicely formed. That is. Look at that. Vintage racers that were... Miatas can't vintage race. Look at how well formed they are in that group. And they cross the line now, and away we go. Tom Fowler leading the way. This the Miata Heritage Cup, race two. They raced yesterday. Fowler on good form there. Robert Spence goes into second place. Bonetti, Robert Spence, and Tom Fowler had a great battle yesterday, and I'm sure they're going to be doing the same again today. Yep, same group of four pulled out ahead with Cash. Right behind in fourth place, Christian Blevins and Skyler Cottrell. The man who impressed me yesterday was Fanetti and uh, Cash. Uh, Mark, Mark Cash in the all black and yellow with the yellow wings. There he is. Double zero. Thank you, Hamish. Spence takes over. Passes yep. Fowler after five. Got a better run out of five. And Look for Anthony Frenetti to duck under. Anthony Frenetti is in the NA, a little bit underpowered from those NBs, but has great power. And there is Boris said the fourth. Did you hear Boris's comment, Boris Senior's comment? Yeah. He was as nervous as he's ever been. Yeah, actually, I was uh, sidetracked with him at turn three on Boris said Jr.'s first lap. And he turned around to me and said, this is the most nervous I've ever been at a racetrack. And to know the kind of scraps that Boris said has been yeah. in in his lifetime, to say that, you know, and the reason why is because it's, you know, it's tough for these fathers to have their sons and daughters out there racing to see that. You don't think about yourself when you're in the car, but, you, you know, you have too much empathy and love for your. Spence takes the lead. You know, as they come, we've got a really good opportunity here because we're really going to get to see Miata. This is why, because of this drone shot. We've got two big straights here. This one coming up. And then, of course, the back straight. But it's the back straight to concentrate on because that's where the strategy comes in. Once you get in a group, you could go faster. It's like a peloton or a, you know, a, a sort of Tour de France type uh, bicycle race because you can push each other forward if you get into groups and sort yourself out and then slipstream. Uh, and then it becomes really quite an interesting battle because you form these groups and they'll kind of do it subconsciously but also consciously. Uh, and then try to race each other and yeah. give each other the advantage. And it's all about timing. It's all about strategy. Uh, but they kind of know each other's game, don't they? They really do. And they work together as a team until it's – and then it's all bets are off. All bets are and off. And sometimes they'll point each other as a fake. you know. But they do want to work together as a team, especially this back group led by Cash. If you can get in a group two or three with that uh, pink car of Cottrell, they'll be able to catch this. I've heard from the Spec Miata drivers that the fastest train is four cars. 
So if they can get in his four car train Why, does, behind, up to five, does it, does, it starts to drag. They said it? three or five isn't as fast as four cars. But That's if you watch Spec Miata racing, sometimes there's a train of 24 cars. Well, now this is the shot I'm talking about. The drone gives you a really good example. The top three forming a group. Then there's uh, Cash in fourth position. But like you say, he hasn't got a group. There is yep. a small group forming just further back in six, seven, but and eight. But the second place went side by side there. I think if they would have stayed in the train, they'd have had a better time coming up early on in the race like this. Now, last lap, they hit bank passes. Aha, here's a pass. But did the lead group there, Ford, pull away from the chasing group, you think? I think so, because they've stayed pretty tight. Uh, Jessie's just coming in. She's in tears. She said she came in empty-handed without grid sheets. Oh, well. It's all right. We forgive you. Now, Jesse, just give me a thumbs up. you got to like this Miata racing, right? Yeah. Two thumbs up. Nice. Two thumbs up. Like That's that. Bill Miller, currently in sixth, fifth in NB. So, Bill, thanks for coming out racing just the 17-year-old. Just the NB and NA. Uh, the NBs are the newer cars, and uh, we were talking about that. It's just a designation on their VIN. But okay. I think um, – I think they started out, and maybe, uh, maybe people can leave us some comments. I think they started out as 1.6 liters, then went to 1.8. But I'm sure we've got some Miata trolls on our SVRA Facebook that would love to give us exactly what it is. But, but only in Japanese, I'm going to read please. your name, so you better be right. Yeah, but only in Japanese, please. We've got cars from 1990 to 2001. As the number 49, Alan Cross makes a move at turn six. And you can see how quickly they're spreading out. Boris said Jr. not having as productive a day. He's a little further down than uh, he was yesterday. He's down in, what, ninth position. But I think he got up as far as six at one point in yesterday's race. Delaney Calhoun currently 19. Comes here comes the train. The group. Yeah. Anthony Fornetti, a little bit Look too out. far he's back. A, he's, almost, he's almost on top. He's in a... He, Spence... Anthony? That's good. Having to defend. Fowler in the middle, Spence up front. That's Anthony Fornetti. I think he is going to win our Mazda Heritage Championship. Hopefully Mark Cephalo is watching somewhere and can tell us all about these MA. And Cephalo has been our Mazda Heritage Champion in years past. We wish he was here. But Anthony Fornetti looking good. And I really like that Pepto-Bismol pink car of Cottrell back there. That just really stands out. Pepto-Bismol pink, yes. That could be an official painting color. Alan Cross, Little up girl's the hill. room. Good stuff. I do, like, we talked about this. It seems like they're making cars to look aggressive these days with, like, the Challengers and Camaros. These I like don't that look Miatas aggressive. have a smile on their face, like the old Bug Eye Sprite. See that? Their face is a smile, like they're just having the time of their life out there racing. Coming up towards tar, uh, to turn six and our group, leading group. Uh, I think uh, Cash is certainly, Mark Cash in fourth place, is trying his hardest to get on level terms with this group. He's given up on trying to get some group racing going. They're the 67 doing the same thing. But he too, that's Christian Blevins, as he comes through seven. Can't make any inroads. Now we've got a nice little group here yes. with the Pepto-Bismol car at the back. All right, Jonathan, I love Facebook for this reason. Charlie Davis, I hope you're right. He's saying NAs were 1.6. Then 1.8, all NBs are 1.8. So NAs are 1.6 liters. NBs are uh, 1.8. And then um, Mike Collins is saying 99 plus use restrictor plates. All right. So thank you, guys. I love it. See? Thank you. You were right. We can't be experts on everything. No, and we've got sure. a lot of experts following us on Facebook. So thank you guys very much for joining us. And this is some good racing. Yeah, it is. This lead group. But look at look at Cash. He's coming. Mark Cash doing a good job. I'm going to take a look at his lap time as he crosses the line now. 145.5. Uh, about the same time as uh, all the others, though. They're all in the 145s. It's so how close they are. So... Cash is making some inroads, but not quickly. Four yep. laps gone. But again, like vintage racing, there's great pack racing throughout. So this is the race for fifth place right here that we're watching. And let's see if we can get the 17-year-old native throwing off some sling there. Cottrell. I'll tell you what, they'll really feel these curves as they bounce a lot. And the tiny little cars, the curves almost bigger than them. But they bounce right off them. Look at this. 
What I love about the Heritage Mazda Group being that they're reliable Japanese cars, we rarely have mechanical failures in this group. So usually whoever makes it to the grid can finish the race. Well, they're dropping the Pepto-Bismol car. He needs some Imodium. Scarlett Cottrell from Georgia. There he is in the 99. Uh-oh, we got a train of four. Here we go. I wish they were a little bit tighter. Not quite a train. They've got enough time. Cash has got enough time to just narrow the gap to the third place. And if those two get together and under braking, maybe, they'll come across the line a little bit closer. Yeah, let's but, see who uh, the, you can really see the differential from this angle of yeah, who's that's what getting I like on about the it. brakes later. See the Looks lap. like Fernetti's got the brakes. He did, yeah, Fernetti brake later than He most. will be left. He's in a 1.6 liter, and the others are in a 1.8. And just that little bit of a difference on the top end will make the uh, 1.8 liter cars just get away from it. Really shows for the driving talent of Anthony Fernetti to be able to keep up with this group of NBs in his NA car. And now, don't be mistaken. It is, Boris said. It is a curly-haired kid who's getting taller and taller, but yeah. it isn't senior, it's junior, the 16-year-old. All right, we gotta, tell, we gotta tell our story about that, because we Come know on. They, you know, the NASCAR ringer for road courses. So Jonathan and I did an E-series for Trans Am that Boris said his dad, the third, joined us. And we kept noticing that in our virtual driver's meetings on Zoom that his son was hanging around, you know, looking in the background. And we just thought, I had met his son at Auto Club and he had told me uh, earlier in February that he wanted to race with us sometime. And I was like, cool. So anyway, we're at Laguna Seca in an E-Series race, a simulator race, with like 30 cars, and Boris said, kept doing weird things. So I called him, and I'm like, what are you doing? And he said, what do you mean? I'm at the shop. I said, what do you mean you're at the shop? You're racing with us at Laguna Seca. And he said, well, that's his son. And I said, well, that, you can't do that. That's against the rules. And he said, ah, ha, ha, it's not against the rules. If you read the rules, it said the driver's name has to match the driver. And my son, Boris, said the fourth is racing in my simulator right now while I'm at work. That's So that's, how that's cool small. is it, though, that Boris said get, making a career out of being the ringer has a simulator ringer in his son. That's I just thought clever. that was so funny. And Always bending the rules, these drivers. So back to the leaders, and they're still the same as they were before, although now the 68 of Tom Fowler has taken up the lead of the group. Robert Spence still in second, and then Fonetti in third position at the moment. And from high above, you can see how Cash has caught up. He's not that far behind now, Mark Cash. And last lap, a 144.6. They're all going quicker. They're now in the 44, so they've all upped the pace. And I think that's because they're forming this group that is pushing them all forward. Yeah, and, you know, it's all about weight, too, with these Miatas. Watch the rear, the front tire and rear wheel of Anthony Fernandez lifting off. But, you know, they've burned fuel. So a gallon of fuel weighs about 8 pounds. So let's say... You know, they, they might have lost 16 or 20, 25 pounds so far. Uh, you know, that makes a big difference in a car this light and nimble. You know, this could be a really nice finish to this one because these guys are all going to clamp up together. There I like is those Mark gloves. Cash. Look at those day glow gloves. Ooh, it shows how bad his hands are moving in there. Keep it up, Cash. It's a dash for Cash. So Tom Smolensky says the Miata is an MG that works. And I, I couldn't See, agree you, more. You know, you you, Amer you Americans, you're so rude about the British cars. Are you, are you I saying love that British the, cars? You basically but saying they, that they the Miata a, is a, re a reliable other MG. than a Jaguar or Aston Martin. I love to drive the, a Jaguar. The other Leyland cars were beautiful, but not quite reliable. No, that's true. Those they, Lucas uh, parts were never really. We'll call it engineered obsolescence. Yeah. That wasn't our finest moment. Design, beautiful, pretty cars, yeah. fast cars. Uh -oh, oh, we absolutely. might have a pass. Here Spence. we go. Spence on the inside of Fowler. Spence back into the lead. Now, come on, Cash, catch him up. Nice overtake. That's a classic overtake at Road Atlanta. And we're going to have a four-way battle fairly soon, I reckon. The clock ticking down, though, so they haven't got too much time. They cross the line again. Let's have a look at the times. 144.5. That just looks like so much fun. Oh, yeah. And again, back comes the 68. Fowler back to the lead. And this is starting but to heat Frenetti up. Fernetti's staying right with yeah, him. Yeah, this is that starting is to heat up. And you know what? As these three at the front do this, look, Cash has caught right up. I knew it would happen. 
So now we've got a four-way battle. Down through the S's. And when they get down to the bottom of the S's at five, they'll start to build up speed again up the hill and go through the gearbox. Here is turn five. And now they start to build. Now there is an opportunity to overtake at six, but it's, I wouldn't say risky, but if you get it wrong, there's not a lot of places to go from there and you lose a lot of time. Yeah, we saw that at Petit Le Mans right there. Yeah. That uh, disputed pass. Now that group that was a group is now two cars and two yep. cars. Skylar Cottrell at the back of this one. Christian Blevins, Alan Cross, Bill Miller, and Skylar Cottrell in that Pepto-Bismol pink. I hope he gets a sponsorship from Pepto-Bismol from this. Yep. Just trying to help him out, you know? Absolutely. So Skylar can race with us more. Well, you gotta why have a wouldn't Pepto-Bismol sponsor that cool car? Well, to go racing, you got to have the stomach for it. Yeah, exactly. You don't want indigestion when you're racing. Here we Look go again. Frenetti looking for a way past it to turn 10. Cash lost a little ground there. And for whatever reason, in a straight line, he's just not as quick. Down that back straight. But you can see he catches up in the, wi the wiggly bits, as I say. This is really, this is fascinating racing because they're so close on times. Fastest lap, Tom Fowler at 144.6. Let's see what they uh, click through this time. All right, so Mike Weinbrenner is giving us, can we get lap times on the top three? Do we yes. have that technology? Yes, 144.6 by Tom Fowler, his last lap. Best lap, 144.67. That was the last lap from Tom Fowler. Robert Spence did a 145.3. That's uh, his last lap, his best lap, a 144.6. And Anthony Finetti, 145.2, his last lap, his best lap, a 144.3. There you go. Nice. Well, and I should add, Mark Cash, his best lap, a 144.6. That's why he's just off the back of this group. But the fastest man so far on the last lap, Tom Fowler, with that 144.676. By the way, if you want to join... And, and watch the timing yourself. Download the app Race Monitor. Calhoun. Delaney Calhoun. You know, I haven't seen uh, Yusuf Muhammad out there. He's in the number four. What's his story? I think he's right behind us. Yusuf Muhammad. This is his first time for Yusuf Muhammad to come and race with us. He's been racing Miatas for quite a while. I met him yesterday. Very interesting person, what he does in real life. He's an attorney in real life, and uh, we hope to see him out here. He seems to be really fast and having a great time. But it was one of those conversations that I wish we could have spent more time talking. He's so interesting. Well, this is – now, when, when do they pull the pin? And what I mean by that is they've been racing quite happily in the peloton, as I call it, but together and pushing each other forward. But when do they say, right, all bets are off? Usually when they get that last lap at a track this long – uh, all bets are off, but it's not like they're not racing right now. They're just jockeying for position and showing each other the line and what they're going to do. But then you're going to see it go up a notch, if you will, uh, once we get that last lap sign. Well, you've got to hit your marks. That's the, that's the key. It, it, they, it may look as though they're not racing, yep. but, of course, all of them are going through the gearbox and hitting their... Uh... That's Christian Blevins we were looking at there and that white number 67. So if you're looking at getting into racing or vintage racing, you know, there's an old saying now in the SCCA that the answer is always Miata. And I'd say if you want to start racing, look to this vintage spec Miata. My buddy Yusuf Muhammad, thank you so much for joining us. He's in that number four. Uh, he was deciding between coming here or going to a race at AMP, and he decided to race with us for the first time. So, Yusuf, I hope we see you many more times. He's 11th at the moment behind Delaney Calhoun. There he is. It's a good race, though. See, I love this pack racing in these vintage series. So that's an NB versus an NA. I like the single stripe he's got going up the hood there. It's good stuff. And he's telling us he's turning right. Oh, see, he's turning he's right. That's courteous. polite. It is. He, he, I love it. he clearly hasn't raced long if he's being that polite. Yep. So the clock ticking down on this Miata Heritage Cup. And I've got breaking news. Tell me. We have timing and scoring on the SVRA app. So download the app. You could be watching this on your app. And you could get timing and scoring 
right there from the SVRA app that's available on Google Play or the Apple Store as Fowler ducks out. Yeah, and Spence took the lead briefly as they crossed the line, but back goes Fowler. This is a really ding-dong battle down. Fernetti's not done Fernetti yet. Fernetti body roll, look at yeah. that. Yeah, he's looking for a way past as they go towards two and three. <laughs> Three-wheel racing at the moment as they dive through the S's. Oh, Jonathan, you're going to have to give me uh, your Australian accent because Peter Dunn has joined us on our broadcast. Ah, good day, Peter. Have you been to the Dunny Dunny? <laughs> oh, I love it. So, Peter, thank you for joining oh, us. Mind if we call you, Bruce? And uh, I love what I'm seeing from vintage racing in Australia and New Zealand, but especially the TA2 racing down in Australia. We've been following them, and we're on the final lap, so we're on the last couple turns here, Jonathan. That's why everybody's getting uh, a little bit more racy. This is going to – now all bets are off, as we said. They come out of seven. This is the long run down towards turn 10, which is really where it all happens here at Road Atlanta. That's the kink at nine. They'll pop into view any second now. Here they come. And when they do, then we're really going to see some action, I hope, anyway. But uh, it was all sorted out. Here they are. Look at this. Ooh, look for Fernetti well, Cash has dropped out. off. He's not going to be in. Fernetti looks to the inside. Fowler still holding off Spence. Ooh. Spence can't do anything Fowler's here. Fowler's he looking at the run. last turn, I think. Or well, Spence Spence's, is just going to yeah, try sorry. and get drive here. But I don't think he's done enough. No. Fernetti might try an, an inside move here as they come towards 12 to finish this race. Oh, no. Last lap. So last oh, lap good. now. So one nice. more lap to go. Come on, boys. I, you know, I love when the races go into overtime Whoa. like that. So disregard the graphics. Yeah. Race Control decided to just give us one more lap of this, and I love it. And Fernetti's coming alongside as they come into two, but he can't quite get close enough. And, of course, these are all pretty identically prepared, which makes the racing so much better. But right now, Tom Fowler's starting to just eke ahead by a couple of lengths. Anthony Fernetti. Your SVRA sticker on the rear of your car is not going unnoticed. Thank you very much for that. Next time we'll give you a second off your qualifying time. Oh, you are very, very generous. Just on tell Rick I said it was okay. Okay. <laughs> Look at this. So Fowler's kind of taken off a little bit on us, Jonathan. Yep. Well, he pulled the pin, didn't he? he but sure I think did. also with Finetti putting as much pressure as he is on Spence. I think that might have just unsettled Spence. And we'll again see the long run down from seven to eight for the final time. Mohammed looks as though he's going to finish in 11th place. Good yeah, start. Look at Fernetti. He's pretty tight. Stand he's very with that NB and that NA. Watch the white car in third place, folks. Out of nine, they come. Nip and tuck. Fernetti goes to the outside. Spence will cover the inside. He's going to try to outbreak him, but Spence has got it covered. Nicely done. But it looks as though Tom Fowler is going to take the laurels and take the checkered flag. He comes down the hill for the last time. And it's been a great three-way race, four-way race if you include cash. But at the checkered flag, it will be arms out from Tom Fowler. Waves to the crowd. And Robert Spence takes second place. Anthony Fanetti is in third. Mark Cash is fourth. Alan Cross is fifth. And Christian Blevins takes sixth place. Bill Miller is seventh. Skylar Cottrell in eighth. And Boris said in ninth position for another good result in his first weekend out. And Delay Delaney Calhoun takes tenth. And Youssef Mohammed takes eleventh. You know what? I have not been disappointed by a Mazda Heritage race yet. They are so much fun to watch. Close finishes like that. All 11 cars that started, finished the race. Uh, we've had groups of 35 start the race and finish the race. Great racing. We didn't see any bumping out there. So all the vintage racers and fans that were hating on us with these Miatas, we've, uh, I think we've proven them wrong and seeing that this is a viable option to get into vintage racing and bring more people into road racing as we see the 17-year-old at Skyler Cottrell right there. There's Boris said Jr., I think 16 or 17 years old, racing with us. So this is the best way to get into racing. And uh, if you want to get fast as a road racer, learn to drive a Miata fast. Fast. But good stuff as the leaders come down and they're giving each other uh, air high fives as they pull up each other and just, you know, love 
these close races like this. Good stuff. So thank you. Anybody involved in the Mazda Heritage Group, that's our last Mazda Heritage Group of 2020. So Nancy Fowler, I don't think this is a coincidence, says, Woohoo, go Fowler. Did I read that right? With the exclamation. So then, Tom Fowler and woohoo it is because he wins in the MB class. Robert Spence, Bob Spence takes second place. Anthony Fedetti takes third. Mark Cash is in fourth position. Alan Cross is fifth. Christian Blevin sixth. Bill Miller in seventh place. Skylar Cottrell in eighth. Boris Sedd Jr. in ninth. And Delaney Calhoun rounds out the top ten in our Miata Heritage Cup. We'll take a short break. We'll be back with more action. We've got some Group 10 action coming up next. Stay with us. When the road calls, we answer. Hit the road with insurance that protects your classic for what it's actually worth and save an average of $264. Get a quote today at Haggerty.com. There's a challenging spirit within Honda. It gives us the courage to go faster. And the thinking to make it real. Whether it looks like a truck, a sedan, or an SUV, inside is the heart of a race car. Welcome back as the roar of the engines live from Road Atlanta. And they are roaring here as Ford has been, well, it's been sort of the thing of the weekend, hasn't it? We've had the top man from Ford here, and we've had a lot of great Fords on display, including this one, getting ready to head out. And a beautiful rumble. There's the Boris said car. I uh, have a correction, journalistic correction from yesterday. We said it was Ken Twaits in that car because Poncho Weaver told me he might race it. But I think it is Poncho Weaver the builder of that car in there racing at us. I, I, oh yeah, that's Poncho, we can see that his glasses. Does look, yeah, that does yeah. look like Poncho. Poncho, I love it, out there racing with us. And then that is the Python. So Peter Dunn, you were watching from Down Under. He is racing from Down Under. That's a Cobra, but since he is from Down Under, we did call it the Python. Did you have a sneaky story for us about the Python? I did, but it's been taken. I can't find it. We've got a stack of papers here. Handwritten. Oh, there we go. See, Jesse Pinnell coming through again. That's George Vitovich. Wow, look at that. He started Python, Python vehicles Chocolates. in 1979 in Australia, building Cobra replicas, started GV restoration, restoring and fabricating classic cars in 1991. So this is going to be a mixed group. This is Group 10. So the International GT and the GT3 Cup cars are in this. So there's different classes in this group. So that's the stock car group right there. The number 94 of Scott Lovett in his 2001 Ford Taurus from Atlanta, Georgia. So Scott, we love it right there with the, uh, and then that's Bruce Raymond in a TA2 car. So we've got different classes. There's GT4, there's IGT, there's stock car, PA. So there's lots of different classes. So that's Bruce Raymond, last year's Group 10 champion. He was in a 80s Firebird with us last year. He is in a TA2 car that he just bought from Silver Hair Racing, out here being fast once again with us. So Bruce Raymond, thanks for joining us. So these are our beautiful grid shots brought to you by Tony. And now we're up in the drone. We shrink down our crew member, Logan, so that he can fly the drone all around the skies of beautiful Michelin Raceway Road Atlanta. You're looking down at the Trans Am paddock. As the cars roll off the grid, that's Brent Burnath in that Ford. And there we go. So I'm going to go through the lineup that I have from yesterday. I'm not sure how many cars stuck around for this in Group 10. Trying to count. So bear with us right now. We don't have the proper grid sheets. That is NASCAR Hall of Famer Ray Evernham, the crew chief for Jeff Gordon through all of his championship career, the crew chief for Bill Elliott. He kind of 
revolutionized the crew chief. And there's almost like it's it's almost like NASCAR broke up in two generations. There's before the Ray Everham generation, and then there's the after. Because once Ray Everham entered the sport and revolutionized the sport by putting athletes, he wasn't. He, I asked him about it. He said he wasn't the first to think about it, but he was really the first to implement it. And once he implemented athletes as the tire changers that come out and do this, because he said the mechanics are worn out you know, throughout the day. They've been fixing the car all night. So he went out and got some athletes that could carry the tires and change them really quick, and he trained And the times for tire changes went down from the 30s of seconds to the under 20 seconds. And, you know, 10 seconds in NASCAR changes and some of these races with six changes, that's a whole minute of time difference. And I've been to Charlotte and watched the Hendricks guys practice. They have the whole pit outside the factory. They literally have a, a, a pit change uh, training each day. It's amazing, um, really amazing. So Barry Blackstone is digging the app, he says. So thank you, Barry. Good stuff. No, it is a good app. If you want to follow SBRA and Trans Am, they both have their own app, and we live stream on the app. Uh, but while you're there, you can, of course, look at the stats and look at the people involved and look at the events coming up. Um, and so, I mean, it's a free app. Just download it. Um, if, it's, if, it's, um, if, if you follow this sort of racing, it's definitely the thing to have because uh, you can really get some great information there. So download the app. Judging by the livery or paint scheme, I think that's Ted Giovannis there with TGM just outside of Bruce Raymond in that uh, Porsche Cup car. Not sure if it's Ted or Hugh Plum. Here we go, oh, then. That's, there he goes spinning off there. The Porsche Cup car I was just talking about. Yeah. Spun. Missed the wall by about an inch, inch. as we look at Ray Everham go up the turn one, followed by Bruce Raymond. This should be a good race here. Yeah, the silver hand. Car in second, Silver Hair Racing Car in second place at the moment. But Ray Everham down the hill he comes in the 24, the Corvette. In the Trans Am race, racing a TA2 car. So That's it's right. not unlike him to see a TA2 car behind him. He's in a GT1 car that he raced with as a VIR. Pretty car that Bruce Raymond's driving. Yeah, very nice. So look for Ray Everham to really pull out ahead in that high horsepower TA GT1 car as we see Poncho Weaver. Ah, Poncho doing a bit of R&D. Yeah, Poncho <laughs> Weaver built, designed that car out of his garage, and now he's out here racing it. Boris said was on the podium with us yesterday. And then that's the number 40. That's Dan Malloy in the Chevrolet Monte Carlo 358 from Georgia. Nice, St. Mary's. Well, welcome if you're joining us on our social media channels. Leave us a comment like this one from J.R. Gordon Sr., who says he really wants us to post a listing of the classes in your groups. Trying to decipher your schedule is pretty difficult. And I believe with that, I think we're going to try on this offseason to get a little bit more uh, easier to understand these classes in more. Yeah, I think that's a good a, idea. And the history of the cars as well. Yes. So. JR, I hope we listen to you there because that was good. And Michael uh, Fornetti says, congratulations, Tony Fornetti, third place. Love from mom in Michigan. Those were the Upers. They got mad at me last time for saying that they were cheeseheads from Wisconsin. They're actually from the Upper Peninsula, and they call themselves Upers. Oh. There he is, Poncho Weaver. And you know it's Boris's car because he's just taped up the rear left-hand yep. side of it. So Boris has raced that to a healthy, uh, what, seventh place? Yep. Today. Poncho Weaver is pretty famous in the stock car industry in Trans Am. He built cars and chassis for Dale Earnhardt, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. He builds a great car, and it's just a pretty much a one or two man operation out of his garage at his house in Mooresville, North Carolina. But I, because every car he builds seems to be at the top of the podium, as we see Ted Giovannis lose something off of his wing on the front straight. So this is the last SBRA group race of the day. And the light fading somewhat because it's a little bit cloudier this afternoon. But we've been blessed with a fantastic weekend. Really have been lucky. There's Vitovic in that Python. Now 
Now, let's have a look at the tyres. There's been in some interest, obviously, in the lap times. Ray Everingham uh, just at a 126.9. He's, he's also doing R&D. Oh, that's David Richardson. Sorry about that. That's not Ted Giovanna. That's David Richardson, currently eighth, but he's the one that went, look, obviously had some contact there. Sorry to interrupt, Jonathan, but uh, wanted to make sure I got it no, right. No, I was saying that we were saying that Poncho Weaver's done some R and D. Well, I think Ray's doing a bit of that too, because of course he's starting his own series, and so I think he's just kind of getting a feel for the cars, yeah. and uh, he's yeah. got some very, very interesting drivers, including our own Trans Am hero Willie T. Ribs. Yeah, and I think after, as soon as he announced that, I bet you the drivers were coming out of the woodwork wanting to race in that. But he and Tony Stewart are putting this together. I think it's called SRX, which should be really fun to watch. Ah, there he is. Now, that's an interesting spectator, So, isn't yeah, it? Boris said. How now, about the tables turn? Yeah, so that's the speed. Poncho Weaver prepares a good car. <laughs> so he he's says. now crew chief for Poncho Weaver. I His like crew it. chief in Trans Am. No, he's not. Oh, he's, he's photographer. Hey, well, He's I'd doing like to, PR. Yeah. Let's see, look at that. Boris said, man of many talents right there. Absolutely. Just your TV screen. That is his true hair. <laughs> Poncho Weaver coming into 10A. I'm sure if Boris was on the radio, he'd be saying, go faster. No, I think he's probably delighted that Poncho's got a chance to try it out himself. So all those things that uh, Boris tells him about the car, he can witness them for himself. So he's ready to take the picture, and he takes it now. There you go. Wow. He's got it. So follow Boris said on social media. Actually, it I'll tell like you he was what, on Facebook Tony Garcia, Live. watch your back. That's funny. I think he was on Facebook Live. I saw video there. You'll see the duct tape All there right. from an off right at this very place that Poncho is. I have a great story about uh, George Vitovich in that uh, Python Cobra. He sold his business in 2017, shipped the race car to L.A. in November of 2017, to race at all the tracks in the U.S. So, Vitovich is living the dream out here in that Python. So, that is a cool story. Well, I tell you what, you created quite a stir yesterday with RC's story about uh, Deepol changing his name. And a lot of people have since changed their name uh, by Deepol. Uh, I'm going to be JR. Uh, so, I'm looking at I've just put the applications in. So, thanks for that story. Uh, that's good. Ben Robinson is out here complimenting the production staff. So thank you, Oben. They're doing a great job keeping up with the cars and following along on this huge track as we see Ray Evernham cross the start-finish line in that beautiful GT1 Corvette showing sparks off that front splitter. Ray's having a blast. Oh, He's yeah. He's loving the TA2 well, class. He, and. We, we he, he, I asked him what happened yesterday, and he looked right at me like a true crew chief. You know, drivers are known for giving excuses. Crew chief, he said, I ran out of talent. Mid-corner. You know, because I'm sure he's heard all the excuses, so now he, as a driver, is going to want to do what he'd like to hear from drivers. Well, you know, the reason why uh, it's important is that uh, he had a big smash yesterday, so he's trying to he's trying to actually sort of uh, get back some kudos because he didn't have a best of days yesterday, did he? He didn't, but man, you know what? I think even on his bad days of racing, he still considers that a good day just because he loves being out here. And uh, so they re retaped the car with white duct tape, and so he races the ghost with us, and then they call that the mummy. So there he is. There's the man out here living the dream, trying to race at all the best race tracks in North America. How many has he got to? You know, I'm not sure. He's been traveling around the USA since 2017, racing the Python at all the most iconic tracks. So we need to ask him that next time, right? Absolutely. But it looks like he's that flying the flag. That looks a fun flag. car to drive, too. Yeah, he's flying the flag, looks like, on the right front fender there. I believe he's from Adelaide, which is one of my favorite cities in Australia. As Twin we City look to again Austin. At Ray Everham. Is it really the Twin City yes, to Austin? Yes, it is. Nice. Well, they have a great downtown area. Well, and of course, Adelaide used to have the Formula One race, so it's kind of somewhat apropos. What a beautiful sound that makes, too. I just got caught up. 
forgot we're supposed to talk about it, but that's uh, a yeah, beautiful that's definitely car. The Australian flag, you're right, on the on the side pod there. So like I said, this is our last race of the day. And at the moment it's Ray Everingham leading Bruce Raymond with Scott Lovett in third place. How do you say aluminum? Aluminium. You do? Well, how do you say Everham? Everham. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. We've got my buddy Tony, the camera guy, joining us up here. Well, He's been Tony, lugging around a 75-pound camera all weekend. Tony's taking the rest of the day off because uh, Boris, Boris said it's just been taken on by Greenlight Television for the rest of the year, I think. Newcastle, England is joining us. Give us your best Newcastle accent. Oh, we are. Good to see you, lads. Uh, I'll be down there at the pub later for a paint with you. He's going to start making much. up places and making them read those. It's Bruce Raymond, last year's Group 10 champion, and new to him, TA2 car. Bruce is fast in everything, and i got to give it up to Bruce. I've heard from several SVRA drivers that Bruce Raymond talked them into coming and racing with us in SVRA. So about 10 minutes to go in this race, which is spreading out quite dramatically, Ray Everingham. <laughs> Leading the way from Bruce Raymond, Scott Lovett, Poncho Weaver in fourth place with Boris said watching on the pit wall and taking the photos. I like that fire. Brent Beemap in fifth place and George Vidovic in sixth. Ooh, I got a question from Shannon, is the Python or big block powered? I would guess it's a big block because that's a very highly developed, possibly overdeveloped car. So I would, I would guess that would be a 427. Uh, just, just by looking at it, I'd say he's going to put everything into it that he can. Look at that, hanging a wheel up there at turn seven. I love it. That's Brent Burnath right there, racing in the Group 10 stock car division. Brent is currently fifth overall. And that's Dan Malloy coming down the S is currently seventh. I love the graphics. Thank you guys for putting up the graphics. And if you're wondering about this production, our editor and the graphics people are actually in the Isle of Man. I have no idea what time it is in the Isle of Man, but I'm sure they're pulling long days there to put this together for us. So thank you very much for doing that. And that's Bruce Raymond right behind him. Ooh, smoking that rear right tire. All right, pick your car. Which one are you going for in this one? I, I don't want to try NASCAR. I think Which I one's going to win? No, no, if you had to drive one. Oh, if I chance. had to drive one, hmm. I, I, you know what? I don't think I'm good enough to drive any of them, well, to no, be honest. Well, this I, is I, didn't too, say, I didn't say that. Too high horsepower. Uh, yeah, I don't think I would Look even attempt sparks to. Yeah, coming off. Nice work, Molly. He's dragging that front end, man. I like that. That's really hitting some sparks. But my, that down. I, I have a favorite car. All right this group. I've got to give it up for Poncho Weaver just because I saw this car when it was just uh, steel tubes laying on a table. So for him to be able to make steel tubes into that, I just think that's a skill that is unbelievable. As we watch Ray Everham, our clear leader in this, and Ray is just one of those guys in our paddock. His wife is here and kids are joining us this weekend and they just seem to be having a blast. I think I'd like to have a go with, in that car there. So you say you love it? <laughs> oh, Scott Lovett going up no, the hill no, right no, there no. in that McDonald's. He, he's loving it. Yeah. <laughs> See, there's so many puns we can play on that. <laughs> Scott, I'm sorry. Uh, you can fully take that out on me, but I love that McDonald's car. To me, there's nothing better than a Big Mac, and now I'm hungry. As the Ford Fusion. Scott, yeah. Da, 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 da. Scott so Jim, loving it. Jim Booth was racing with us this weekend in Radicals and in our Group 9, and he owns several uh, McDonald's franchises in the Southeast. 
So he probably loves Ooh. that car too. It's he had a bit of a moment there turning into seven. Swirly. Look at that. Car's getting I lower love and sparks lower. sparks coming off Ray's car. Oh, it's 837 in the Isle of Man. See, don't you love Facebook? Thank you, Stephen uh, Lackenby. The, the Isle of Man are tuning in? Where, who's this? No, they're not in the Isle of Man. I just said I wonder what time it is there. Oh, I see. Well, the pubs are still open then. So why is he sporting the number 24, do you think, Jonathan? Ray Evernham. Well, man, I'll answer that question. He's sporting the number 24 because it's Jeff Gordon's number. Yeah, I always think it's brave when you pick an iconic number like 48 or 24. Because you're, you're really saying to the rest of the world, I'm as good as that guy. But, you know, you may not be. Dan Malloy in the number 40, the Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Come on, Poncho, give us a give us a good lap. What's his best lap? Poncho did a 131.7. That's handy. It's I not, wish Boris not... would have come up here and given us his insight. <laughs> Boris was doing 121, so he's 10 seconds off Boris. That's okay. Boris can breathe. That car just... Uh, it travels really well. Just noticing it, how it moves. It, it looks like it's just very well set up. Our race leader. I'm sure Ray's going to be happy putting that into the trailer under its own power in vintage racing. That's the first victory you're looking for, to have a great weekend, to finish the Sunday race. Put the car yeah, he'll, under he its own he power. He can forget that into tire trailer. wall incident now mm -hmm. if he finishes. Yep. Yeah, he'll totally forget about it because now he's going into the offseason with a victory in our group 10. He's had a great test in this kind of new to him car and uh, he's just had a lot of fun racing with us. I, I think uh, Ray should give us uh, a sort of celebrity Trans Am SVRA stroke entry into his series so we get one entry per, per round. And we can we can we can select the guy. Well, I think uh, I'd be surprised if we don't see his buddy Boris said in I was that about series to say, at some point. You think Boris would be in there? Knowing the talent that he I has, Andy Lally should give it a go. Yeah, Andy Lally would be good. But I know that Ray and Ernie Francis Jr. Ray has done a lot for Ernie Francis Jr.'s career and helped him out a lot. And I know that Ray, you know. If there's anybody that can spot talent, it's Ray Evernham, and he seems to have taken a liking to Ernie Francis, so I'd like to see something develop out of yeah, that. Yeah, and, and Ernie, I think, is ready now to, to, to break out, if it were, as it were. Seven titles in Trans Am. How many more do you want? He's up there with Jimmy Johnson, Michael Schumacher, and Lewis Hamilton now in terms of titles. But uh, Ernie, at 22, 23, is he? Could, could really 22. do anything he wanted from here on in. Yeah, I just got a comment from uh, Roger that these stock cars look like a handful through those S's, and oh, they sure totally do. Look they at are. that. And so some of the stock cars that race with us were road course stock cars, but a lot of them, because the road course stock cars were pretty rare, a lot of them are oval cars that they, they set up the geometry to run road courses, which have a little bit of a disadvantage over the chassis that were built specifically for road courses. Yeah, we found that out when uh, Tony Stewart uh, took a NASCAR around um, Coda last year b before the Formula One race, which was a lot of fun, to be honest. But he enjoyed it, and I think that was actually the catalyst that uh, sort of gave the go-ahead to look at Coda as a potential circuit for NASCAR. And now we're seeing more road circuits uh, pop up on the NASCAR scene. We are. As we see Ray Evernham's fire come out right over that JRI shock sticker. Another one of Ray's companies that he bought recently. So he does shock development too, and that he might be doing that this weekend. Well, he's getting some development yeah. on those shocks, that's for sure. Sparking his way to victory here. Clock ticking down, and this will probably be pretty close to the last lap. And I'm just looking to see, yes, the last lap board is coming out. So ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at a NASCAR Hall of Famer leading our Group 10 race, coming down the hills at the S's, Ray Evernham.
coming over the crest towards six. Ray Erinham, Bruce Raymond, Scott Lovett, Poncho Weaver fourth, Fred Van Aff, uh, Van Aff in fifth place, George Vidivic. Vidovic in sixth place, Dan Malloy in seventh, and then David Richardson in eighth position. It's an eight car race. So our buddy Adam Seculo is watching from next door from the driving club at Road Atlanta. Thanks, Adam, for joining us in the booth. We're going to be back here next year, yeah, so you got to join you, us again. And thank you, Dustin, too. And very much thank you yeah. to Kerry Hitt, because poor old Kerry was supposed to be racing. His Cadillac conked out, but uh, he gave us a really good insight into the Trans Am all-class race, which was a, a doozy. That was, that was a great race today. As here we go. NASCAR Hall of Famer Ray Evernham is going to take the checkered flag to finish the 2020 season with SVRA. No, oh, he's going to take the last lap lap. There you go. Oh, well, we're doing it again. Overtime. <laughs> he's not so hard on the brakes this time. Notice that the no, sparks yeah, yeah. did not come out. We get the final lap coming out. He's, he's easing, yeah, he's easing it off a little. Yeah. Well, he knows a, a thing or well, two like about easing chief. the equipment. Yeah. He would say, win as slowly as you can. But would you argue that the likes of Chad Canaz and all the guys that uh, do it today would have probably learned from this guy and thought, okay, this is how you do it. Like you say, he was an innovator. Yep. And now the modern day, modern day um, crew chiefs uh, pretty much follow They've his all suit. adopted his yeah, policies, all, all adopted, theories, yeah. yeah, and they haven't gone back. Now, I have heard, notice that the center locking hub on his GT1 car. I have heard that NASCAR is going to that instead of the okay. five lug nuts. So when they come in for the tire change, it won't be the <laughs> it'll just be the one. You do that well. Should, and they should also, be, they, I, they're looking at air jacks. Okay. So, they're bringing to, so they won't have a jack man anymore. They took our jobs. And uh, they won't have the lug nut guy anymore. <laughs> and there he is, Bruce Raymond, last year's group 10 winner, but I think he's gonna have some competition there with Ray Everham. Great year for all the Silver Hair Racing team. Congratulations to Rafa and Morris Hull. Uh, been a good year. Rafa didn't quite do it. But here comes Ray Evernham down to turn 10A for the last time to round out somewhat uh, appropriately the year of SVRA with uh, a bit of an iconic hero in American motorsport. Who better to take the final chicken flag of the 2020 season than Ray Evernham? who takes the win here in Group 10 in the Jeff Gordon number 24. Well done to him. Bruce Raymond comes across the line in second place. And I'm just waiting for the third Bruce. car to come across well, the line. That's Bruce. There. Oh, that's Bruce second. You know, and I've got a feeling it could be Poncho. Maybe. Let's see what happens here. All right. We'll look up the hill to if, see who comes if out. There's a from. blinding car that's coming down. <laughs> you can't miss it's it. It's like glowing. That's, there he comes. There's Poncho. I'm not sure where he's where he's at. If anybody's ahead of him, Poncho Weaver in his newest. He said, I think he said fourth generation. So there's Hinkle. Well, there's bragging rights to be had here because yeah, Boris said him. didn't get a podium, podium. with it today. Poncho Weaver is going to podium, and Boris said did not. Boris said just missed it. I think he was in fourth. Yeah. And that is the fourth Poncho Weaver this generation. Nice work. Of the Dodge Challenger. Way to go, Poncho. Yeah. Scott Lovett takes fourth position. Brent Bar uh, B Marth in fifth place. George Vidovic yeah. in sixth place. So now Dan George Malloy can seventh look at that. David <laughs> gives the the oi to the corner workers. They're very nice. And uh, now he can mark I Michelin Raceway, Road Atlanta, off of his bucket list. Yeah, he's got an interest. Oh, that's an Aussie sign if ever I saw one. So, a great day of racing once again. Well, a great weekend of racing. Uh, ben, your thoughts? Final thoughts of the year? It's been a tough one, I know. It's been a crazy year. And uh, thanks, John Claggett and Tony Perella for putting the schedule back together after 2020. Yeah, no question. No question. So we are going to come back and uh, round up the rest of the day and the year and the weekend. But uh, there's confirmation that Ray Everenham wins ahead of Bruce Raymond. Poncho Weaver, the car maker turns car driver in the Dodge Challenger in his own made car. What a wait, great day for him. Takes third place. Scott Lovett takes fourth. Brent Bernath in fifth place. George Vidovic in sixth. Then Dan Malloy and David Richardson. 
We'll take a short break here from Road Atlanta and we'll be back to wrap it all up with what has been a sensational Trans Am and SVRLA weekend. Join us after this break. Why am I excited to drive? It won't be a burden on my family to drive me to my extracurriculars, including swimming, show choir, voice lessons, youth group, and leadership programs. It's a place that I need to be, like sports, and so my parents don't have to drive me, and so I can have a social life. I'm excited to drive so I can go from 2 horsepower to 100. I could say because of freedom, but I'm more excited for what I will be driving. A 1972 Datsun 240Z. I'm excited to drive because I'm going to save the manual, like this one. Hey man, you can't drive that thing yet. You don't have a license. I am excited to drive because it will be a monumental step to a life of independence. And who knows, maybe my dad will let me drive his favorite. Beats walking. Welcome back. We are smiling underneath these masks as we've had a lovely weekend. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a bit of fun, hasn't it? Have you enjoyed your weekend and have you enjoyed your year? I have, and I'm watching Poncho Weaver go over the bridge right there. But we, you know, we when we scheduled this in November, I thought, oh, the weather could be terrible. But it has been perfect. I don't think we could have ordered up better weather. We had great racing, and it's kind of melancholy to wrap up the 2020 season. It's been a rough season just because of all the delays and the pandemic and the moving around the schedule. But we made the most of it. So thank you, Tony Perella and John Claggett, for making that happen. But it's been a fun year. How about you? Yeah, I mean, like I said, to me, John Claggett uh, and Tony Perella stand out because for the simple reason that they've managed to do it and pull it off. Uh, and also to uh, people who don't get the mention, uh, the people who've been taking the temperatures, been taking the registration, been doing the COVID forms, everybody working behind the scenes to make this happen. They don't get the credit. Uh, and thank you to all of them for, for, for making our season possible. Um, but maybe let's leave it with your kind of driver or achievement from somebody in SVRA and maybe Trans Am, who do you think? Who do I think that made the best achievement? Yeah, somebody who you'd like to point out, it doesn't matter whether they won or not, but just somebody who did something special. Wow, that's really putting me on the spot. You know what? I was very impressed with Jet Nolan today, finishing third. He's kind of new to the TA2 series. So in Trans Am, I'm going to have to say Jet Nolan. And in uh, SVRA, my favorites right now are Andy McLean and Scott Frazier. Their little battle on those bug eye sprites in Group One, of course, Group One. And uh, so that's those are my standouts for Trans Am and SVRA. All right, I'm just going to go with the man who won his seventh title. Uh, no question about it, Ernie Francis Jr. He broke a motor. It's a family-run team, and he is the epitome. He's just 22 years of age. He's incredible about what he's achieved already and long may it continue. The future of Trans Am is in good hands if people like Ernie Francis Jr. are with us. But I want to thank everybody who's been involved this season. My thanks to Ben Sissel. Thanks for you for watching. We'll be back next year from Sebring in February. We've got a massive season of, what, 14 races in Trans Am and 18 races in SVRA. Until then... Get some sleep, get some rest, enjoy Thanksgiving, and happy Christmas. We'll see you next year. Bye-bye for now. What if they sold tires online? We do. We're TireRag.com. They could offer lots of tires and help you find the right tire. It's called the Tire Decision Guide. Oh, and they could ship them to a nearby mechanic. We shipped over 7,000 independent recommended installers. This is an amazing idea. Sorry. Visit TireRack.com slash Pirelli to find the full line of Pirelli tires. Pirelli, power is nothing without control. TireRack.com, the way tire buying should be. I found a place. 